here. I have announcements. Okay, so first announcement for you guys. I uh, got a few emails. Gosh, darn it. Bearing screen. I got a few emails that um, we were having problems submitting Lab 10. So um, I extended the deadline Ooh, for Lab 10, the integument lab, right, her, um, till tonight. So if you had problems submitting it um, yesterday, then um, you have until tonight to get that in for uh, full credit. And um, just wanted to point out, we've got our, the, let's see, the video is up from Tuesday. So the bone tissue lecture video is up. And then today we're going to, um, uh oh, I lost my, oh no, there it is. Sorry, there's the PowerPoint for today. Today's uh, lecture is going to cover uh, everything in the um, text as well as everything in our labs 11, 12, and 13. So we're going to be tackling all of the info for 11, 12, and 13 labs uh, today in lecture. That um, covers Yep, that covers the axial skeleton and all the bone markings um, with some other stuff like development, uh, if we get to it. So another long one today. Um, it's a short PowerPoint, but it's dense. I'm not going to go through every single bone marking and what they do, because one, um, I don't know off the top of my head. For a lot of them, I'd have to look it up. And two, it would take for freaking ever. So we might actually have a bit of a short uh, lecture today. It'll be relatively short, but um, it'll be very, very, very dense. And there's a lot, a lot of information for you guys to memorize, um, to learn and memorize uh, from this. So um, like I've been warning you since the beginning of the semester, um, skeleton and muscles, uh, skeleton in particular though is, is very heavy. So um, I also would like to point out some of the resources in Wiley Plus that I think um, would be super helpful for you guys um, at this point um, and at all points. And I should have pointed this out to you a long time ago, but uh, basically if you're looking at uh, any of the modules, okay? So you basically you are home or whatever. Go home. We are home. We're all home, right? So if you go home on Wiley Plus, go down to wherever, whatever you want to study. So bone tissue um, from Tuesday. Uh, and then for today, we've got the axial skeleton, which is chapter seven. We've got all of these different um, uh, sections. You know this, we've been through this. There's also an assessment at the bottom here that I hadn't had published um, for the previous um, modules. So I went ahead and published it for this week, last week, and pretty much every week for every chapter, even if it's stuff that we're not covering, just because, hey, you might be that bored. I don't know. So um, if you want to uh, quiz yourself, it's not worth any points. It's not gonna like go on your grade or anything, but there's some quizzes here. Uh, in these modules for each of these chapters. And then of course, if you go into any of the sections of the module that you wanna learn about, um, I was digging around here. We've got um, one, don't forget to look at your interactivities. I'll go ahead and um, link this. Um, write myself my note. Interactivity. Okay, activity, yes. So um, you've got your interactivities, which are cool, um, but not even the coolest thing, as I've discovered. Um, so this is neat just for, this is just axial versus appendicular skeleton. Cool, whatever. But what's really cool that I've noticed, and I don't know how many of you have discovered this, is the practice tab, uh, which is in all of the sections of each module. You'll have a practice tab. Um, and it's basically like a never ending quiz that you can just go through and answer questions um, on whatever is in that module section all day long. 
which is very, very nifty. Um, what else did I find here? Under the Explore tab, maybe? Where was that? Mm -hmm. Ugh, there is like a self assessment. Wait, oh, I now remember now. Okay, hang on. Okay. Back to home, back to modules. If you look at the end of every module, it is that, so that this, this quiz that I was talking about at the end of every module that I've made like public for you guys now. Um, it's really neat because it's um, a never ending quiz that you can take, but I thought that there was like this whole big, okay, I'm gonna have to dig around a little bit more. I found this really neat like whole self-assessment thing. If somebody else has seen it, and knows where exactly it is. Um, it basically lets you see uh, everything that you, uh, like you get to take quizzes and then you get to see which parts of it you're not as good at so that you can work on that stuff. Um, and I'm really sorry that I have missed it. Oh, sorry, it's adaptive practice, duh. Okay, sorry. Okay, so you've got the quiz, the assessment. There's another little section called adaptive practice and adaptive practice is really cool. I'll go ahead and view as a student so you guys can see what it looks like for you. Um, but it basically lets you um, practice on any subject like over and over and over again and it shows you like your stats. If, if anyone has has done like inquisitive for any of their online classes it's kind of like that you guys. Okay. It's just like inquisitive and it's pretty cool. I liked it. I did it. I think. Are you that one student? Yeah. I know there was. There's like. There, I can see in my stats. That there's one student that had looked at. Oh yeah, that was that was me. I was bored, and I'm like, let me give it a shot. <laughs> it's so okay. So good. So we have some like hands-on review of somebody who's actually like looked at it. Um, I haven't actually seen Inquisitive, so that's pretty cool. Um, that that's a, that that it's. Um, applicable to something else that you might have already been using or might have used in other classes. Um, so that's cool. I was just like kind of blown away by like the detail of like, just like the stats that it'll direct, that it'll make for you to show you what you're being more proficient in and what you should study more. So uh, really neat, something to check out. Um, and then that I think was about it in terms of what I wanted to, um, show you guys on here that I wasn't sure if you guys had seen before, if you hadn't done any much exploring yourself. I'm just going to go ahead and pull up our Mr. Skellington over here, just so that I have it open. Okay, so that we can use this guy. All right, so. Let's get started on chapter seven. We are on page 208 of your textbook um, or your e-text, which I realized I should probably just be using. Go, go to the skeletal system, do the thing. We're here. Okay, here we are, we're on chapter seven. We're gonna talk about axial skeleton and bone markings, okay? So again, heavy, dense, let's get started. Um, so, okay, so your axial skeleton versus your appendicular skeleton. We've got doo -doo -doo -doo, the axial skeleton, which is composed of, it's basically the axis of your body, right? So it's composed of your skull, your thoracic cage, um, and your um, vertebral column, right? So your axial skeleton is blue here. We've got 80 total bones in the axial skeleton, and most of them are skull bones because your skull has a shit ton of bones in it. Sorry about that. It just is um, a lot of bones in there. Our vertebral column, of course, has a bunch of bones, um, and then the thoracic cage, um, all of the ribs and stuff, but it's really not that bad. 
the skull is really where all of the all the major bones are. So again, skull, vertebral column, and thoracic cage are your axial skeleton, and your limbs and the girdles that hold those limbs to the axial skeleton are referred to as your appendicular skeleton. And that's what we're going to talk about. Not next week, because next week is spring break, uh, but the week after that. It's like week um, week ten. Week 10, April 21st, we'll, talk, we'll start talking about appendicular skeleton. So we're going to get to learn like all the phalanges and metacarpals and stuff then. But for today, we're going to do the bones of the skull, the vertebrae of the vertebral column, and your ribs and sternum of your thoracic cage. Okay. Oh, hey, there's your axial skeleton in a hideous neon green color. Sorry about that. All right, so before we get started on the axial skeleton specifically, uh, we're gonna talk about some uh, general bone stuff um, because that's what your textbook does on starting on page 209. So we've got long bones, which we talked about a lot on Tuesday, right? Those are the guys that and I put away. Let me get my rooster. And for... Those of you that um, had only saw the recording of Tuesday's Lab, um, forgive me, and I hope that I have fixed it, but I think the, um, the video of my face and all the things I was trying to show you on this little rooster bone um, were not being recorded. So I think I have fixed it. Hopefully this recording will have some of this stuff, but I'll try to refer both, um, not just to this, I'll try and refer to visual stuff in the shared screen as well. But long bones are bones that are longer than they are wide. So like your arms and leg bones, right? And your ribs are considered long bones. Short bones are bones that are not wider than they are long, longer than they are wide. Uh, they are instead, um, they can be very cube shaped. Um, so they um, include the bones of your wrist and ankle and some of your toe bones, your foot bones are just kind of like sort of wide, chunky bones. So those are your short bones. Flat bones are, of course, flat. Um, a lot of the bones of your skull are considered flat bones. Um, and your scapulae, right, are flat bones. And your sternum and the two sides of your pelvis um, are, I think they're flat bones. They may be irregular bones. Um, I should probably look that up. Let's see. Pelvis. Flat or irregular? I'm sure it's in your textbook, um, but I ain't got time for that at the moment. And then we've got irregular bones, which are bones that uh, don't fall into any other category because they're that weird, and that includes your vertebrae, right? Your vertebrae are very, very strange, very uniquely shaped bones that um, defy classification, so we just call them irregular bones. And then sesamoid bones are uh, usually very tiny little, um, little tiny bones that are found in your joints that basically just um, hold and keep uh, ligaments and tendons um, from pulling or from rubbing in those joints. So um, there, you've got lots and lots of teeny tiny ones that we're not going to learn. The only ones that we're going to, the only sesamoid bones that we're going to learn in this class are your uh, patellae, so your kneecaps. Um, to, you have two patellae, um, singular patella, right? So your kneecap is your patella. Okay, so those are the general different types of bones. And any and all of those types of bones can have uh, any various uh, combination of bone markings. And bone surface markings are basically just um, all of the different um, parts of any particular bone, okay? So basically there is a name for every single type of bump and ridge and groove um, and hole, et cetera, um, that you can find on a bone. They all have a name. Um, so basically we can, we talk about bone markings um, in terms of um, their function. So um, their shape and their function. So basically the shape of the marking um, has to do with what exactly it does. So obviously a hole is going to let something pass through it. Um, something like a condyle is going to be an articular surface in a joint. Um, you've got uh, grooves, 
um, and ridges that are important for um, blood vessels and nerves to sort of like travel along down a long bone or the surface of any type of bone. Um, the various types of like ridges and protuberances that are basically places for muscles to attach. All of these types of things have a particular name. So I'm just going to go through them super duper briefly. Uh, we will see examples of these um, as we go through today, and then we'll, we'll see examples of the rest of them, again, a way, way, way along the way in week 10, so after next week. So in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about some of these. So we're not going to see all of these um, today. Um, so we'll just see some of them today, and then the rest of them we'll see week 10. So uh, fissures are basically narrow slits, so they're holes except they're long and skinny holes. Foramen are uh, larger, rounder holes, okay? So a foramen is a hole, it's a round opening um, for blood vessels, nerves, or ligaments to pass through, okay? Um, foramina is plural for foramen, okay? Foramina. Uh, fossa is a shallow depression. Okay, so kind of like a bowl in, um, in the surface of a bone, a shallow depression in the surface of a bone. Um, I think we will actually, I don't think you actually need to memorize any of the fossae of the skull, but they're uh, most, a lot of them show up in the skull bones. A sulcus is a furrow, so it's like a, a groove, a furrow or a groove along the surface of a bone. For a blood vessel, a nerve, or a tendon to like sit in, okay, so it kind of is protected in that sulcus along the bone. I don't know if technically this is a sulcus, but there is a, a groove all the way down this uh, tibial bone. I don't know if you can see that very well. There. So this, this sort of like indentation, this groove channel all the way along down the end, down this, the down the entire length of the bone uh, is a sulcus that um, blood vessels and nerves can sort of lay along and be protected there. A metus is kind of like a foramen, except that it is a more tube-like. So it's like ex it's an extended hole. It's a tube, okay? So a, a foramen is just a, an opening, and a metus is an opening that's sort of tube-shaped. It's like long, okay? A condyle uh, is found on, actually on some of the bones that we're gonna talk about today, um, and, but um, uh, notably on long bones. At the ends of long bones, you're going to have condyles, okay? So those are going to be large, they're gonna be rounded protuberances, right? Which is like a projection or something that sticks out with a smooth articular surface. So this would be the condyle, one of the condyles of this bone here. So you can see how it's rounded and how it's pretty smooth there um, for articulation. We've also got facets, um, which are, um, let's see, we've got one here on our vertebrae. A facet is a smooth and flat um, it can be slightly concave or convex um, surface uh, for articulation with other bones. So each of your uh, vertebrae has facets um, where basically that vertebra um, interacts with the vertebrae next to it. Okay, so it's got this one has fat, two facets down here where the vertebra below it would interact with it via the two facets up here, okay? So that's how they kind of stack. So facets are just sort of like flat areas, smooth flat areas for articulation. The head of a bone is the, um, the rounded um, projection that is supported by the neck of the bone. So the neck of the bone is basically where it gets skinny, um, and then the head of the bone is like the big fat end of it where the articulation happens. So that's more of like a general term. Uh, whether or not it has a condyle depends. Um, like your femur, right? It has a, a skinny neck and then a big round ball of a head on it that fits into the socket joint of your hip, right? So um, the head of a bone uh, is generally referring to long bones. A crest on a bone is a ridge, okay? So it's kind of the opposite 
of a sulcus, okay? You can kind of see a ridge along this bone here. So it's a long, skinny, sharp projection, okay? So it's a long ridge on this bone here. Um, and an epicondyle. So remember, a condyle is the large, rounded, articular surface at the end, at the end of a long bone. The epicondyle is like a, a bump that is associated, um, that is above the, um, the condyle, okay? So the epicondyles would be uh, here and here on this bone, okay? So basically like um, slightly smaller or slightly and slightly above the main condyle are the epicondyles, okay? A line is similar to a crest, uh, except it is smaller and skinnier, okay? Um, a crest is something that's going to like, like project out from the surface much more than a line would. I don't believe we have, I think it's really hard to see here, but there's a crest here and there's a line just below it. If you can see that line, like sort of in the sulcus of this bone. Um, so a line is like a, a, a shallower, longer, skinnier crest. A spinous process is a sharp, slender projection. Um, your vertebrae, uh, and some bones of your skull, which we'll talk about today, and your vertebrae we'll talk about today, have spinous processes. So it's basically like a long, skinny, sharp projection. So this is a spinous process of your vertebra, of this vertebra. A trochanter is a general word for a large projection. So most trochanters are um, on your long bones and they are just like big old bumps that allow um, for muscles or ligaments um, or tendons to attach to. A tubercle is a, also a large, um, it can be a large projection, but it's rounded. So you have tubercles, um, I believe at the ends of some of your long bones. Let's see if we've got a picture example, I guess not. The tubercle of the humerus might be a good example, but I will have to Google it. So let's do that. This is a great, I mean, I'm doing it and I like, I fully expect you guys to be doing this to literally just like Google stuff if you don't know what it is um, or want to see a picture of it. So the greater tubercle of the humerus is going to be this rounded bump here. Um, just, it's like, it's part of the head of the humerus, right? So this would be the head of the humerus. This would be the neck. We've got a tubercle right here. Here's another, ooh, that is, that's not so helpful. How about this, better? Okay, a little bit better. This um, was the lesser tubercle, this is the greater tubercle. So again, a rounded bump on the bone and that's where muscles attach to, right? This is like, you got a lot of your deltoid muscles that attach here, right? Because this is where your humerus, attaches to your scapula in your shoulder joint, right? So in order to like lift this bone, lift your shoulder like this, those muscles are attached to these tubercles on the outer edge of your humerus, right? Okay. And a tuberosity <laughs> um, is like a tubercle, except it's uh, less rounded and more uh, bumpy and rough. So let's see if we can get a, here we go. Okay. So again, so we've got the head of the humerus. What a beautiful drawing. I wish I could draw like this. So nice. We've got the head of the humerus, the neck of the humerus, the greater and lesser tubercles. And this tuberosity is a bump that occurs on the diaphysis of the humerus. And this one is called specifically the deltoid humor, uh, tuberosity because this is where the deltoid 
uh, reaches, one of the deltoid muscles reaches all the way down to here in order to pull this, this bone um, upright, to pull your upper arm bone upright, right? All right, here's some fossae, right? So a fossa is like an indentation. So here's, our, here's some fossae here. Um, and they've got names, right? They've got specific names depending on where they are, what bone they are, and what muscle or what um, blood vessel or nerve um, they, they function along with, okay? So the radial and coronoid fossa, the radial fossa is going to be associated with the radius. The coronoid fossa is gonna be associated with an artery. Um, Olecranon fossa is gonna be um, associated with um, generally the joint that uh, is your elbow joint, okay? We'll talk about the elbow joint. Um, Ashley? On two weeks from now, three weeks from now. Yeah, shoot. Um, sorry, I just, oh. they've dogs and kids. I came a little, that, but I, um, <laughs> we're in that. Lost. <laughs> You're lost? lost? Yeah, where are we at? Are we doing? Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's, we're going to be talking about, we're talking about chapter seven. We're going to be covering everything in labs 11, 12, and 13. And right now we're talking about bone surface markings, which um, starts on page 211 in your textbook. And I'm really kind of um, going through something um, vaguely uh, resembling table 7.2 on page 212. So I'm just sort of like going through generally the different bone markings because we're going to see these when I talk about the bones of the axial skeleton today and when we talk about the bones of the appendicular skeleton in week 10, so after our spring break. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And I was just wrapping up with our tuberosity here. It can be of various size and it's uh, rough and bumpy. Um, and can be anywhere on the bone. Um, I don't think there's really a very good example on my little rooster bone here, um, but we saw it on this beautiful drawing of the humerus, and here's it on a photograph. Here we go, that's a nice one, of the humerus. So here's this, so again, variably sized, this one's pretty shallow, but a, um, a projection, a bump, a rough, bumpy bump <laughs> on the bone surface, okay? as opposed to a, a tubercle, which is um, associated usually with the, um, the head of a bone. So this is the head of the humerus. This is the neck of the humerus again, and we've got the greater and lesser tubercles, which are more rounded projections up here. And tubercles and tuberosities, again, are basically projections on the bone where muscle or ligament or tendons can, attack, can attach to can attack, can attach to. So remember when we talked about Wolf's Law and how bones will um, generate or lay down more bone tissue in places where there's greater mechanical stress? Places like the deltoid tuberosity and other tuberosities um, or the tubercles of any of your bones uh, are places that will get thicker if you work out, right? If you work out your, if you're working out your, your deltoid muscles, you're working out your delts, then you're going to be uh, probably growing your deltoid tuberosity while you're growing those muscles. Okay, pretty cool. All right, so let's dive into the bones of the skull. Your text, it has gorgeous, gorgeous pictures of this. Um, so I hope that you guys are using it. Oh, here's your, here's a nice uh, infographic about the different types of bones, the general types of bones, long bones, short bones, uh, flat bones, irregular bones, and sesamoid bones, right? All right, bone surface markings, components of the skull, there it is, look at that, it's so pretty. I love all the rainbow colors, and as you'll see, I have incorporated some of the rainbow colors uh, in this, uh, as in our PowerPoint as well. The images that I have are, um, from a different text um, because Peggy Campos uses a different textbook. Um, so um, the colors are more for differentiating between the different bones. Um, I hope that doesn't confuse you guys because the colors are different between the PowerPoint and the textbook. 
So uh, the colors are to differentiate between the bones. Um, and I hope that your brain um, is okay with um, seeing it that way and not like associating a particular color with a particular bone, which we really shouldn't do anyway, right? Because we want to be able to recognize the bones for their shape and not for some arbitrary color that's been assigned to them. So there are two sets of bones in the skull, in the, in the human or I think most animal skulls as well. We've got cranial bones, which are the bones that specifically are part of the brain case, okay, or the cranial cavity. So the cranial cavity is the, is the big hollow place in your skull where your brain lives, right? Um, the cranial bones are the bones that make up that cranial cavity. Um, the cranial vault is the name for that hollow place where your brain lives, okay? The cranial base um, includes anterior, right, towards the front, ventral, um, middle, um, I guess you would refer to that as mostly like inferior, and then posterior or uh, dorsal uh, cranial fossae. So I have removed those from the, from the images on the PowerPoint to simplify because your lab manual doesn't ask you to memorize those and I'm not asking you to memorize anything differently in lecture and lab, okay? So what it asks for in lab is, you know, is what you need to memorize. So those fossae, which again are um, shallow indentations, they're basically like the rounded bowls on the inside of the cranial cavity for your brain to sit in. Okay, you actually, you actually have um, a very nice image a little bit farther along. So you can see, um, you can see the fossae a little bit from this perspective, but this perspective is really nice for seeing the fossae. And all that what's referring to there is these sort of like indentations or bowls where your brain sits. In your, in your cranial um, vault, in the cranial vault, in the cranial cavity. And we've got a chat. Do I recommend ordering a skull? Oh my gosh, great question. I was this close to going into the garage and digging up a, like, a Halloween skull from the raptors. Um, but it wouldn't be, obviously it wouldn't be helpful like in super detail, but gosh, if you can get a hold of a, of a skull model, um, I, think it would, I think it would be awesome. I think it would be awesome. I think it makes a great decoration in your house. Um, it's, they're just good to have. <laughs> It'd be like just really cool to have anyway. Um, I'll just dig one out of my backyard. Yeah, there you go. Find yeah, go find go dig up an, uh, some sort of a, a burial ground and find a skull. Yeah, and be cursed for the rest of your life <laughs> and your children's life. And your I'm just kidding. Life, right? <laughs> I know. If you can find one, you can find a skull model, or if you can afford a real human skull, um, <laughs> if you want to buy it and not dig it up. <laughs> um, that would be awesome. Yeah, my, my greatest regret, I think, with this class going online is literally this section. So um, this, the skeletal system is like, that's really where the hands-on is really very, very cool and important. And I'm sad that you guys don't have it. Do we have an image of an exploded skull? We should. Cranial bone. So let's see if we've got an exploded skull in here or anywhere. <laughs> Looks like maybe no. Okay, so in the physical text, there's this really cool picture and I recommend finding one. I'll find you guys one online and I'll post it somewhere. But um, this is, um, it's got another fancy French name or something, but it's an exploded skull. So you can see all of the skull, the skull bones, um, like separately and individually um, in this like exploded skull, um, which is um, really useful. And again, I'm really sad because we have a really cool exploded skull model in the lab that I feel like was really helpful. Um, so we're going to um, have to identify the bones, um, 
in a picture of a regular non-exploded skull, right? Um, from various angles. So there are some bones of the skull that you can see um, from the anterior view. Uh, there are some bones of the skull that you can only see um, from a, an inferior view or from an internal view. Um, and there are some bones that you can see from multiple views, um, obviously. So um, that's why we're doing this, the color coding and stuff. Um, and if I find a good exploded skull um, picture, image, um, then I can maybe color code that one too, which would be pretty cool. What they've done here in your, in your e-text, I think, is they've um, removed, they've sort of like taken some bones out like this. So like this, the sphenoid bone uh, is a really weird trippy bone that's like right in the middle of your skull. And it's hard to comprehend what it looks like by itself um, when it's not associated with all of the other skull bones. Um, so they took it out here so you can see uh, what it looks like by itself. And same thing with the ethmoid bone, another really weird bone that's in the middle of your skull. Okay, so let's talk about those, right? We've got, um, so cranial bones, which we're going to talk about first. And then after that, we're going to talk about facial bones, which is the other type of skull bone. Okay, so cranial bones make up the cranium, um, which encloses the cranial vault where your brain lives. And facial bones are basically all of the other bones of the skull. They are the bones that make up your face, the framework, framework of your face. They're not directly associated with the cranial vault. Okay, so they don't make up a part of the um, the hollow inside of your skull. Instead, they're um, all, they're like on the outside of your skull in your face area, right? So we've got, they include um, lots of uh, specialized cavities, right? So holes, um, including like your ocular cavities for your for sight, for vision, um, your mouth for taste, and uh, nasal cavities uh, in the skull, hollow places um, behind your face um, that are used for smell and other things. There are other nasal cavities, and we're going to talk about those too. Openings for air and food passage, right? So like your nose um, and your mouth again, um, and sites of attachment for your teeth and muscles, right? So these, all of these bones have um, muscles attached to them and other bones attached to them, so you need um, bone markings on all of those in order for that to happen so that you can make facial expressions, right? You can do that. <laughs> All right. I uh, had coffee today. I had some. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good idea. <laughs> Even if you're just sitting at home, good just just to have some coffee, especially if I'm going to be talking for two and a half hours. So, which hopefully I won't be, you know. But you know, we're off we're off to an okay start. I'm I'm babbling a little bit. I need to get going. Okay, so let's talk about the cranial bones first. Okay, the bones of the cranium. Again, they are actually like making up that hollow space called the cranial vault where your brain lives. These uh, cranial bones, uh, there are eight of them, and these are them. <laughs> they include the, um, your temporal, occipital, frontal, and parietal bones, which are like the bones of your like skull, right, that you think of when you think skull, and they're also um, associated with their um, with the brain portion underneath, right? So you have like your frontal lobe underneath your frontal bone, your parietal lobe underneath your parietal bone, the occipital lobe underneath your occipital bone, and your temporal lobes underneath your temporal bones, right? And your temporal bones and your parietal bones are paired, right? So you have one, two parietal bones and one, two temporal bones. Um, so uh, two of those, two of those, one of those, one of those equals six. And the last two bones are those freaky deaky bones in the middle of your head um, that are shaped really, really weird. Um, the sphenoid bone and the ethmoid bone, okay? The sphenoid bone, as you'll see, uh, you'll see why, but it's also, um, it can be casually referred to as the butterfly bone, okay? Because it kind of looks like a butterfly when it's pulled out separately. It's um, this guy here. So it kind of looks like a weird 
freaky butterfly or moth. Um, not so much from this superior view, but very much so from the posterior view. And I have, a, I actually have an image of that at the end of um, my little cranial bones spiel here. So we'll get there. And then the ethmoid bone is a funky little, it actually looks like a little brain. It's like a little like ossified brain looking bone that's actually like right behind the bridge of your nose. Okay. Whee! Okay, so here's my uh, beautiful interpretation, uh, colored, color coded interpretation of our um, cranial bones of the skull. So basically what I've done here is I've taken the same images um, in the PowerPoint and for cranial bones, one, I've labeled it as cranial bones. And uh, two, I've color coded the cranial bones according to the color that was in this uh, image of the skull. Three, when I'm talking about cranial bones, I have only colored, I've only put color in those bones that are cranial bones, okay? So anything that's still in black here are facial bones. And then I did the same thing vice versa for facial bones. So I colored the names of the facial bones um, and their um, associated bone markings um, and then left the cranial bones in black um, so that you can like hopefully kind of focus on what we're talking about and be able to differentiate between which ones are cranial bones and which ones are facial bones. So also the um, associated markings with um, any of these bones that we're about to talk about are going to be the same color as the bone, right? So these um, bone markings are, this bone marking as well, are part of the ethmoid bone, okay? And then these markings are part of the frontal bone. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pull out the lab manual. We've kind of done, we have done page 37, so we talked about um, our bone markings, the osteological terms of bone markings. So uh, moving on to page 38. Oh, we talked about vertebrae there. I'm actually skipping ahead a little bit, sorry, to lab 13. So I've skipped ahead to lab 13. Um, we're gonna go back and do 11 and 12 here um, in a bit, but I wanted to stop, start at the top, right? I kind of wanted to keep this, um, going flowing with your textbook. So it covers everything in the lab but not necessarily in the order of the lab. So lab 13 is your skull bones. I'm kind of looking at page 41 of your lab where it says uh, the individual skull bones. Okay, so this was how I basically made the PowerPoint is from this lab. There are a few things in this lab that I have and in this PowerPoint that I have omitted that I'm not asking you to memorize. So if you have your lab manual in front of you, please turn to page 41 and grab a pen or pencil. Probably, a, I mean, a pencil if you've got one would be, would be nice, but whatever. And cross out the stuff that I tell you to cross out, okay? In general, if it's not on the PowerPoint, then you can cross it out. It's not something that I'm asking you to memorize. Um, but we're gonna start with the sphenoid bone, which is hot pink uh, in, this, uh, in this image. Um, we're gonna talk about all of the different um, markings of the sphenoid bone as we go through. The, I'm not gonna talk about them, I'll name them, and that's about it. But the ones that I'm not going to talk about and I'm not going to ask you to memorize of the sphenoid bone are the medial pterygoid plate. So uh, I have crossed out the medial pterygoid plate. I've crossed out the lateral pterygoid plate. I've crossed out the anterior clinoid process. And I have crossed out the posterior clinoid process. So these pterygoid plates and these clinoid processes, you do not need to know, okay? So go ahead and cross them out, okay? That's for the sphenoid bone. So sphenoid bone is in hot pink. 
We've got the greater wing visible, making up the posterior wall of your eye socket, okay? The um, optic foramen, so again, a foramen is a hole, right? It's a hole going through the bone. The optic foramen is where the optic nerve from your eyeball passes back into your brain, okay? Um, so I'm going to be jumping back and forth a little bit here. We're concentrating on the sphenoid bone and its markings right now. Here is the sphenoid bone from a lateral view. Okay, so you can also see it from the side of the skull. <clears throat> Again, this is the greater wing. Okay, so what we're seeing here is what we're seeing here and here. Okay. Here's the rest of the sphenoid bone. This is an inferior view, right? So here's again this, the, the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. And then from this view, we can also see the foramen oval. I don't know what goes through there. I'm sorry. Probably a blood vessel or a nerve. And the foramen spinosum, also probably a blood vessel or a nerve. Okay. This. So. Mm -hmm. oh. Professor, I'm sorry. The sphenoid bone goes across the entire head then, right? So it's yep. that whole piece. It's this, it's everything that's in, that's in this pink color and this hot pink color in all of these images is the sphenoid bone. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird uh, butterfly shape if you were to take it out of the skull, right? Um, if you're looking at, you're looking down at it, um, well, if this is the, if this is a superior view. Oh, right, so this is the anterior view. Okay, so this is looking at the sphenoid bone from the front, okay? So like from this view right here. So basically, um, if you were to pull it out of this skull, pull the pink bone out, bone out of this skull and turn it green, it would look like this. So what you're seeing right here, the greater wing, that part that makes up that posterior part of your optical um, socket, your, um, your eye socket, is literally this part right here is this part right here. Okay, so this part right here is this right here. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So hopefully that helps you to sort of orient what you're what you're looking at. Looking down at this right here, if you're looking down at it, right, it looks like this on the inside of the skull. And this is why it's a cranial bone, right? It's because it actually makes up part of this um, this cranial vault. It actually it kind of it touches your brain. It's one of the bones that actually is associated to is actually can be touching your brain. Um, if that makes sense. Okay, so again, here's the greater wing. You can't see it from the posterior view, um, but this inferior view, you can see the greater wing. Again, you can see a couple of these foramen, so you can see the uh, foramen uh, oval and the foramen spinosum here from this view, and you can see the pterygoid, did I say that we're not doing that? Pterygoid process. Oh no, we're doing the pterygoid process. So those uh, pterygoid plates, the medial and lateral pterygoid plates are like, they're this and this, I think. Um, but I'm not asking you to know that. Just know the pterygoid process is this um, projection here. It's this like sharp, sharp pointy thing. It's on both sides, okay? Um, so you have two pterygoid processes of your sphenoid bone. We've got a couple of the foramen here. And then looking down at it, so this is the same view, this is this, so there's it in green, we're looking at it in pink. You can see from here the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, okay? So the greater wing is down below, the lesser wing is up on top, the lesser wing is um, like back up here, right? These like horns, because it's flat. From the top you can see that it's more flattened and the greater wing is down here. So greater wing is down here, lesser wing is up here. And the cella tersica, which I also have here for you guys to learn, is a trippy little um, 
It's basically like a little cup. Um, I'm not sure what the specific um, definition of of a cell of a cella is, but I would assume that it's like a um, like a deep, like a cavernous cup or something. Um, but it is specifically it is the place where your um, pituitary gland lives. Tersica. Tersica. Okay, so if you see it, if you can see it from this, if you could see it from the side, it is like a, a deep little cup and your pituitary gland lives right in there. Look at how cute it is. So that's your cella tersica from a lateral cross section. And from the top, from a superior view, this is what that kind of looks like. You can see the foramen oval and spinosum here again, but now we can finally see the foramen rotundum, which was not visible uh, in this image because the pterygoid process is in the way. So the foramen rotundum is like underneath there. Okay, so we've got now our three foramen. We've got the greater and lesser wing of the sphenoid, the cella tersica, and the um, oh, and the optic foramen, which we could see from the um, anterior view, right in there. Right there it is. Okay, so that wraps up the sphenoid bone. Any questions on the sphenoid bone? It's I know it's terrible. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, here's another picture of it. This also is a. Um, this is a superior view with the cella tersica right here, the lesser wing, the greater wing, and you can kind of see the, I believe that that is the foramen um, oval, I think that we can see right there. Okay, all right, I'm moving on then. I'm getting these nasty ones out of the way. Let's talk about the ethmoid bone next and because it's next in your lab. So I have asked you to cross out, or I am asking you to cross out on the ethmoid bone, the superior conche. Can you see that? The superior conche and nothing else. Okay, so just cross out the superior conche. You don't need to know that. All right, but let's talk about the other parts of it. So we've got this like funky, sort of orangey brown color for the ethmoid bone. Professor, did yep. you, by chance, did I miss it? Did you go over what the lesser wing is? Yep, the lesser wing is seen as seen from an interior uh, superior view. So this is the inside of the skull, right? Looking down on it. You can see the lesser wing from here. So the lesser wing is up here. Uh, the greater wing is down here. If you were to look at it, um, you can't see, so you can't see the lesser wing from the outside of the skull, basically. The greater wing can be seen here in the back of the eye socket, and it can be seen uh, in the side of the skull, like in your temple region. Um, but you can only see the, so this is the bottom. This is the bottom of the sphenoid bone, right? This is an inferior view. You can see the greater wing from the bottom, but the lesser wing is only, can only be seen from inside of the skull. And if you look, if you were to take this bone out, this is the this is the same view. So this is an anterior view of the sphenoid bone. But from here, if from a when this when it's part of the skull, you can only see these little parts of it. If you were to remove it from the skull at that same position, it looks like this. So here's the lesser wing that you can't see from this view, right? Now so back here somewhere. Got it. I found it on page 221 in the book, the butterfly picture that uh, you see oh, there. Excellent. That, yes. that helps. And then now like for the exam, are you going to be able to give us this image where we can see both of them together? Okay. Well, um, oh, you mean having it like removed? I'm saying like this specific picture, like this kind of a picture, like this, this kind of a picture, like where the bones are different colors. It, it could be, uh, it could be various views. You have to okay, be able to so. identify it from various views. 
Got it. So it's not just the anterior view. We have to view, be able to view it from, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have to be able to recognize it from any angle. And this is why this section is so shitty without having actual physical models for you to put your hands on, because it's so different for you to be able to hold it in your hand and rotate it and look at it from various angles, which is partly why I'm hoping that I can find you guys. I'm sure that this is not, this is not helpful. Is there like a skull? Like specifically a skull. I want to find you guys specifically a an exploded skull, like a 3D exploded skull. Like not like not a gif, but something that you can manipulate. Anyway, I'm gonna I'll find you guys something that you can like manipulate and like turn it around in space. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed that Wiley does not have something like that. I'm still a little bit surprised, actually, that they don't. Muscles in motion, anatomy drill in practice, the axial skeleton. Kind of, kind of lame, guys. I wonder if there's actually um, something in here. Out of curiosity. audio. Hmm. Thanks for nothing. The hell. All right. So rather than like you guys trying to like just use your imaginations <laughs> on that, I'm going to try and find you guys some sort of a 3D model that you can like rotate in space, you know, on the two-dimensional screen of your computer. Um, and hopefully that will help. But having multiple images from multiple angles um, is uh, not a great substitute, but it's the substitute that we have. And your text does do a really nice job of giving you multiple various angles of these bones. And having them color coded so that you can see like what you're looking at is helpful too. I just wish that we could have like, could we have like all the views of the sphenoid bone? Like show us a superior. Um, an inferior, you could find them online, actually, if you Google, you could probably find, like, just Googling, um, like, inferior view of the um, sphenoid. Especially? Yeah. That top, right, before you click enter, that top uh -huh. where it says visible interactive, mm -hmm. I clicked on it. Yeah. And um, on Google. Oh, on Google. Yeah, where it said, where you, if you go back to the 3D. I clicked on it and it showed me a good uh, 3D, uh, you can- Ooh. Is it something we have to pay for? What is this? No, I didn't pay for it. It's literally uh, showing me like it zooms in and out. Right now when it loads, you'll see it. Oh my God. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. This is exactly what we want. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you clicked on that, Kim. I would have assumed that it was um, a paid, a paid thing. Wow. So that's, so, so that's pretty cool. It's that's Josephina. <laughs> yeah, look at that. That's actually really. I didn't mind correcting her. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Joseph, like to call us Kim. I'm glad that you. I'm glad that you that you clicked on it, um, so we could see that. So I'll I will link this uh, or I'll post this link uh, on Canvas as well because that is exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, you can also pause it too, so you can like That's see from the inside and move it around, and then move it around. That's really nifty. Yep. That's what I'm talking about right there. So this is why the skull is um, challenging, because look at all those bones in there, right? Like all these little tiny annoying bones that uh, you didn't know were part of the skull. Um, we are learning about all of them now. So I'll probably come back and revisit this. So I'm gonna leave that there. I'm definitely going to post the link to the exploded skull. Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. Good deal. So the ethmoid bone is another bone that uh, you can't see it in its entirety from any particular angle of the skull. Um, so uh, you can see it a little bit here on making up the medial wall of the eye socket. Um, and you can see a little bit of it through the nose here as well. So 
it's um, this and this are connected. They're part of the same bone back there, as well as this and this. So we've got from this view already, the perpendicular plate, which is this long skinny one right down the center of the nose coming down from the top, right? We also have the, um, the middle conche, right? So each one of these is a concha, right? And so together they are the middle conche on either side, uh, lateral of the perpendicular plate. And the orbital plate, which is basically just the part of the ethmoid bone that um, is making up the, the, that wall of the eye socket, okay? So it's basically making up this wall of the of the orbit, okay? So the orbital plate is like a flat plate-like surface in the orbit of the eye socket. So let's see where we can see the orbital bone from other views. From a lateral view, you can kind of, again, see that orbital plate. You can't see it from a posterior view. There's not much to see from the inferior view, but you can see more of it if you were to look from the inside of the skull. So again, this is why it's a cranial bone. It's touching your frontal lobe here. This is the ethmoid bone from a superior view. And you can see the crista galli, which is a crest right on the very, along the very, very top, a crest or a ridge along the very top of the ethmoid bone. And the cribiform plate, which is where all these little like holes are. Um, but it's like this flat surface on either side of the Krista Gali. And I think that actually is it for the sphenoid bone. So here is the sphenoid bone if you were to actually take it out of the skull. So if you were to remove it from the skull, it would look like this. So it's a weird, funky looking um, bone and it's actually like kind of, um, it's sort of long also from anterior to posterior. So it's actually sort of like weirdly brain shaped. Um, so on the top, you can see the cristagalli here, the cribiform plate, oh, sorry, the cribiform plate here and here, the perpendicular plate, um, making up this long sort of spinous process um, down the center, that, which can be seen through the nose, right? Uh, and then these um, nasal conche, the middle nasal conche on either side, lateral to the perpendicular plate you can see here and here. And I'm assuming that, oops, we also get some sort of a view of the ethmoid bone. There it is. So you can see from, if you're looking at it from the, um, from the, from the top, so if you're looking down at it, it's this sort of weird, funky, um, weird brain-shaped sort of bone right in the middle of your face. Okay, so. There it is, and here's what it looks like on the inside. So it's actually got a lot of hollow spaces. A lot of those nasal cavities are part of the ethmoid bone. And we'll talk about those momentarily. Okay, so first let's go back, and now let's look at our um, the major cranial bones, okay? So uh, the sphenoid and the ethmoid bone are weird. You can't see them from all angles. They're embedded inside of the skull. Um, and if you remove them from their context inside of the skull, um, they're kind of weird to recognize and you kind of have to um, take a close look at that. So actually, the ethmoid bone, ooh, that's kind of a good view, is right here. Okay, so it's that guy right there. You can see them a little bit better right there. So it's that weird, that's probably a pretty good view of it right there as well. Okay, so it's a weird sort of brain-shaped bone right in the middle of your face. So here's the perpendicular plate you can see right here. All right, so since it's right in the middle, it's a little bit weird. And see how it fits together with the sphenoid bone. So here's that butterfly-shaped sphenoid bone um, just uh, posterior to the ethmoid bone, okay? the greater wings, the lesser wings up above here. Yeah, this is gonna be a nice resource for you guys. I'm excited about that. 
Excellent. Very cool. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Having a little too much fun there. Okay, so let's talk about the temporal bones. Okay, so these are the bones of your temples. You have two of them. From the anterior view of the skull, you can see a little bit of them right on either side. They are this light orange color. From a lateral view, of course, is where you're gonna get the best view of your temporal bone and its associated markings, which include, and I'm asking you to know all of them. Yes, I am, I'm really sorry about that, I have to. Uh, the squamous part, which is basically this biggest, flattest part um, on the outside of the skull, okay? So basically, like, you can touch it almost right here. The zygomatic process, okay, is basically the back part of your cheekbones, okay? So you can kind of feel your zygomatic process here. Um, that's um, attached to your zygomatic bone, which is actually a facial bone, okay? So the zygomatic bone is different from the zygomatic process, and the zygomatic process is part of your temporal bone, okay? Which makes it part of a cranial bone, okay? Um, we also have the, um, the mastoid process, which I'm not sure if you can feel that from the outside, but it would be right behind your ears would be the mastoid process, which is where the muscle that allows you to open your jaw, right, pulls the mandible down and back attaches to the mastoid process. So there are actually lots of muscles there, obviously, but, um, but one or several of them pull from here to here in order to open your jaw. The styloid process is this really weird, um, long, skinny projection here. Styloid, like maybe like a stylus or like a pen, okay? So long, skinny styloid process here. Um, which I think might actually be a connecting point for your, um, um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but this freaky deaky bone, your hyoid bone, I think maybe your styloid process might be a little, a place that where that can attach um, muscularly. Okay, and we'll talk about the, we'll talk about the hyoid bone in a bit. Okay, temporal bone, squamous part, mastoid process, styloid process, zygomatic process, and then we've got our one and only metis that you guys will ever need to know for this class. So remember, a metis is like a foramen, except it's a long tube, okay? So a metis is a, is a long tube-like opening. The external auditory metis is, you guessed it, your ear hole, right? So this is uh, your ear canal. Um, that's how your, um, your ear connects to your brain, right? Is through the external auditory metis. Okay, so that is all of that first part, that first chunk, okay? So we basically have covered all of these that you can see from the outside now. The rest of them are stuff that you can see from other views, from the inside, from other views. So let's see if we can find them. Um, we can see again the mastoid process of the temporal bones here from a posterior view. Down here from an inferior view, again, here is the zygomatic process, uh, the styloid process, um, the mastoid process is here. Mastoid process, styloid process, the auditory, external auditory metis is here, uh, labeled on this side. Um, but then from this view, we can see the petrous part of the temporal bone. So that is this, uh, the, basically the bottom surface. The bottom surface of the temporal bone is the petrous part. And then we can also see the carotid canal, which of course is going to allow through your carotid artery to your brain, right? So this is your, where your carotid goes in. And the, the stylomastoid foramen is this little guy right here. Okay, so carotid, oh, carotid canal, jugular foramen we haven't seen yet, stylomastoid foramen, mandibular fossa, 
So let's see if we can see some of those other things from a superior view. Okay. So you couldn't see it from an inferior view. Could we? Oh, no, we could. Sorry. Jugular foramen. Sorry. So the carotid canal and the jugular foramen are right next to each other, right? Because one is a vein and one is an artery and they both feed your brain. So those are the major blood vessels um, of your neck, right? So those are the holes in your skull where those blood vessels reach your brain. So the jugular foramen um, is passage for your jugular and the carotid uh, canal is for your carotid artery, the jugular vein and the carotid artery. Stylomastoid foramen, um, another blood vessel or possibly a nerve. I don't know. You don't need to know. Again, external auditory canal, styloid process, and mastoid process on this side. Zygomatic process here. Okay. Petrous um, part of the um, temporal bone here. Okay. And then from the inside of the skull, you again can see the petrous part. So again, the flat bottom part of the temporal bones. And you can see again the jugular foramen coming inside now and the, um, oh, the internal, oh, sorry. So there's the jugular foramen. I'm not sure why we can't see the um, carotid canal from this view, um, but don't worry about it. Um, we can only see it from a um, inferior view. Questions on chat. Does the zygomatic arch differ from the zygomatic process? Excellent question. So the zygomatic arch is going to be, it's going to be different. The zygomatic arch is actually part of the zygomatic bone. Okay, so basically what we've got here, what we've got going on here, oops, actually this is a good view, is the zygomatic bone, which is actually a facial bone, so it's in the front of your face and not a cranial bone, right? The zygomatic process is part of the temporal bone in orange here, okay? So the zygomatic process is part of the temporal bone, which is a cranial bone. The zygomatic arch um, is just, I think it's, it's referring to this part of the zygomatic bone, and uh, if I'm not mistaken one it's not in i don't think it's labeled as such here nor is it something that you need to know in terms of the zygomatic bone in particular the zygomatic arch it's and it's kind of a general term for like your cheekbones is the zygomatic arch but the zygomatic arch includes your the zygomatic process of your temporal bone and your zygomatic bone proper, which is actually a part of your face. Okay, but the zygomatic arch like is your cheekbones, basically. Ugh, that was a that was a messy one. I hope that cl that clarifies it a little bit. As on page two nineteen of your book, it's showing the zygomatic arch, and you can see that it actually is including. Actually, let me see if we can find it um, in here. Does it show the same thing here? Facial bones. No kitty. Not right now. I'm busy. Leave me alone. Here it is. Okay, so this is what that what our, my chatter is referring to. The zygomatic arch referred to right here is including part of the um, the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process, which is technically part of the temporal bone. So um, it includes uh, part of the zygomatic bone, which is a facial bone, and the zygomatic process, which is part of the temporal bone, which is a cranial bone. What a nightmare, right? Does that matter? Are different from zygomatic? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Uh, yes, the zygomatic arch is referring to both um, part of the zygomatic bone as well as the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. 
Okay. So I hope that clarifies that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we got everything in the temporal bone there. Did I miss anything? Mandibular. I think we got all the foramen and fossa stuff of the temporal bone. So let's move on to the occipital bone, which is, of course, uh, covers your occipital lobe, which is uh, your visual lobe, which is actually in the back of your brain. Um, so we can't see it from an anterior view. Um, we can see it from a lateral view, so it's this nice brown color. Lots of brown for these skull bones here. Um, so this is the occipital bone, as seen from a lateral view. And of course, from the posterior view is the best view for the occipital bone, or one of the, one of the best views, there are, there's others. Um, and from this view, we can also see the external occipital protuberance, which you need to know. And the occipital condyles are uh, sort of visible from here, but the occipital condyles are better viewed from the inferior view. You can see them right here. So these condyles are, um, there are, they are articular surfaces, just like the condyles of, at the ends of long bones. So like this is a condyle right here. And so is this right here, because it is smooth. Um, it is, instead of being convex, it is concave, but it is where the top vertebra of your vertebral column um, articulates with the skull. Okay, so we'll talk more about that vertebra uh, in a bit, but this is the occipital condyle. Here's another view of the external occipital protuberance, which is just like a ridge um, on that bone, on the bone. The condylar canal, I'm not sure, it must be um, blood vessel that um, transports, or that is transported through the condylar canal. So these canals are right next to the occipital condyles, right? And then this monster hole right here, of course, is the foramen magnum, which is the great big hole in the bottom of your skull where your spine attaches to your brain. Okay, so this is how your central nervous system uh, passes through from your skull to the rest of your body through the foramen magnum. So uh, if we were to flip this over now and look at it from the inside, right? Here's the foramen magnum again. From here, we can see the hypoglossal canal, the plural. Okay, so these can only be seen from the inside, right? Um, and that is it for the occipital bone. Okay, so we had from lateral view, from a posterior view, the external occipital protuberance and the occipital condyles, flipping that over. Here's the occipital ex, uh, protuberance, the external protuberance, um, and here are the condyles. Here we can also see the condylar canal and the foramen magnum, and then from the inside, the foramen magnum and the hypoglossal canals. Okay. Professor, I have a quick question. Go for it. Um, for the, I know you're crossing off a few from like each section, but you didn't cross anything off for the temporal temporal bone, right? No, we can see all that stuff. We can right. see all the stuff on the temporal bone. Okay, thank you. No problem. You guys are, you guys are like, you guys are starting to feel like you're gonna be nurses now, I think, I hope, right? <laughs> this is starting to get like. It's a real deal. Definitely. It's a real deal, man, this is it. This is really it. Um, okay, so um, last two, frontal and parietal bones, uh, not a nearly as big a deal. The frontal bone, is of course here covering your frontal lobe, right? Um, the major, really the only the two uh, markings you need to know for that are going to be the frontal arch, which has several other names I noticed. I'm not even sure if your text uses that term, but it's in your lab manual, so that's why I'm using it. Um, okay. Where's my beautiful picture? There it is. Yeah, so the, um, it's also known as the supraorbital margin. So in your textbook, it is referred to as the supraorbital margin. Um, but your lab is calling it the frontal arch. So 
I called it the frontal arch, but it's the same thing as this, the superorbital margin. That's the frontal arch. Same thing. It's basically your um, brow bone, okay, is the um, frontal arch or the superorbital uh, margin. The only other thing is the uh, supraorbital foramen, which luckily is named the same thing in your text in your lab. That is this little guy right here, which is going to um, supply nerves for you to be able to do stuff like this. Right? <laughs> Super important. <laughs> Good question. Yep, go for it. So we're only crossing out a few things from the sphenoid bone and boy, what the hell, and ethmoid bone. So far, yeah. I have uh, a couple of things crossed out for the maxilla when we get on the next page. Could you please repeat what we're crossing out for the ethmoid bone? Absolutely. So here it is. For the ethmoid bone, we're crossing out the superior conche, and that's it. Okay, thank you. It was the sphenoid bone that had a bunch, so these ter pterygoid plates and the clinoid processes we're uh, omitting. Professor, how are we um, supposed to draw all of these? Like, how, like, what would you be need, I wouldn't, I, you can draw it. If you feel comfortable drawing it, try drawing it. Um, but I would recommend um, finding images online, just Googling skull bones unlabeled, or I'll find some for you as well. And then just like practicing, like to treat it like a coloring book, you know, like color in the different bones uh, so that you can see like, where they are from every view like you it's like it will, it'll force you to figure out like where that bone is so like it'll force you to color in like this right here and you're like shoot what is that and if you don't cheat um or if you have to cheat if you go and you look you'll realize oh look it's part of the frontal bone like this is actually part of the frontal bone right here um and if you you're, if you use multiple resources like including this awesome exploded skull that Josephina found for us, right? It was Josephina, right? <laughs> um, you'll see also again that this is the frontal bone and that is part of the frontal bone right there. So I would recommend finding a black and white um, pre-done drawing thing, unlabeled image of all the different skull bones, facial and cranial bones, um, and then trying to color it in and trying to label all the different markings. Um, since we're not First, able to identify them on an actual bone models, drawings are going to be the best, the next best thing. So for mm -hmm. us to turn in these labs, how, like, what are we supposed to do specifically? You can um, print out your picture and color it. You can draw pictures. Uh, you can make flashcards. You can um, do whatever and then just like send me a, a picture of whatever it is that you did to study for this. Um, uh, I don't really know how, what to ask you to turn in other than that. Um, other than just like taking a picture of whatever it is that you decided to do. Um, I don't want to um, make something uh, mandatory that doesn't help everyone. Although I do feel like it would probably help everyone to uh, label a generic skull picture. Let me think about this since it's not due for another week. Maybe okay. I'll uh, maybe I'll find one that I like and then I'll post it and then I'll say like color this in and take a picture of it and send it to me. You know? Okay. Only, only reason is is I don't I personally don't have access to a printer. Oh. Um, yeah, See? that's the other thing. Yeah, I'm on an iPad another right thing. now. I yeah. don't have access to a printer. Um, well, if you're if you're on an iPad though, can you you could upload it into a I was, like program, right? That's what I was gonna say. Am I able to? Is there a program that I can do that? Okay. Let me let me do some research on that. I don't I don't think it would be a problem if it's the, if it's just a static image, then it won't be a problem for you to just like just draw on top of it. But I'll see if I can find like a specific like a specific app that would be good for that. So let me see about. Um, okay, yeah, because it's just that right now what I have is just a standard iPad. It doesn't. Yeah, have, like, I'm sure that we'll be able right to now. find something that can that can import import an image that you can draw on, that you can draw on top of. Okay, so for yeah. now, do you we'll want us to just study, like, 
for now, study it however is most easy for you. And then I'm gonna, I'll find like a cranial facial like series of images for you guys to color on. And if you wanna print it and color it, then cool. If you wanna color it um, through an app or with a program and send, you know, an image of that, um, either way is would be totally fine. And then that's how I'll I'll do my little that's how that's how we'll that's how we will um stay honest in terms of like having something to actually do, which I think right. would be helpful for you guys, you know. Some I'll give you some direction that way. So hopefully okay. that'll be helpful. Um, so then um at this point would you not would you recommend us not working on the labs just yet? until you're able to find us something do whatever you want to do you know i think if i think if you if you want to work on it however way that you think would be easiest for you um and if even if, you know even if that just includes just doing the um the uh the practice you know like going through and doing the um let's see what the actual like the assessments or the adaptive practice specifically like for bone tissue, axial skeleton, you know, even appendicular skeleton, if you want to get ahead, this is all stuff that you can do uh, over the spring break. Um, for coloring labeling app for tablets, um, maybe some more direction on study things to do. I think I'm gonna, I think I'll do a, um, a discussion or an announcement or something when I get this um, sort of more solid. Ooh, like coloring anatomy book from Jessica. Do you, does it have um, all the cranial and facial bones? Um, I think so, yeah. It's, so it has like, that. And then it even has the, um, like the <gasps> an exploded skull. Yeah, <laughs> that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, do you do you have a scanner? Um, like, yeah, I work at a print shop, so I can scan it tomorrow morning, and then I can email it to you. That would be awesome. Yes. Would you do that? If you, I mean, if you if you can't, let me know, and I'll find something. But if you can, oh, I can. That would be so rad. That would be so cool. Okay, cool. So then I, that way I can send you guys all the same thing. Um, and then you can, you can print it out. Um, I'll make it, I'll make sure that it's in a format that can be uploaded into uh, an app for iPad. Um, yeah, and we'll find out what kind of, what app would probably be good. What, which apps would work for that, um, for coloring on top of things. Yes, and then you can just take a screenshot. From your ipad and send that for your assignment okay awesome yeah. thank you so much yeah. no i'm glad we had this conversation thank you for asking <laughs> it's like keeping it loose is fine if you have like lots and lots of self-discipline but i don't i know that like as a student when i was a student i never had the self-discipline to like figure out my own stuff you know right uh, honestly so i was just i was kind of dreading drawing the whole school mm -hmm. drawing and everything i was like I think that would probably okay. It, it, I feel like that would almost, I don't want to say that it would make it worse, but it would be, it would be, it would be a nightmare. It would be a yeah. Nightmare. No, I'm going to, I'll that'll be much better. <laughs> I'll give you guys a, I don't want to look at them either. <laughs> I'll give you guys something to label and then send back. Or Jessica, in, where'd you buy that? Yeah, where is that from? Um, I got it. I ordered it from Target online, but I think they have them on Amazon. They have different, different, um, different types but I like this one because it was a little more detailed. What's it called? Um, it is the human body coloring book and the, the cover looks like this. That is so awesome. Oh they do have it at Amazon. Sweet. Can but you say can you can you tell us how much it is? Thirteen dollars and fifty nine cents. Yeah I was like, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Look that's pretty sweet. So oh that's awesome. Yeah, so set, send me the, the the cranial the cranial and facial bones ones yeah. um, pages if you can, um, like and we'll do that for now. It might be beneficial for everybody to get one. Like it has like the hand. That would be pretty awesome. That would be oh. pretty. Awesome. I think Does it show it all the different angles? Me bucks. I'll try and find stuff. Um, you know, um, 
that I can send to you yeah. guys. But if you can, if you if you have twenty bucks and you don't mind um, doing that, then that looks like a really pretty cool resource. It looks mm -hmm. like a cool resource. But I will. I'll. But if you can't, let me know, and I will find something. We'll find something for you. Okay. So I want everybody to know that. For sure. Money's not an object. I know that some of us are having a hard having a hard time. You know. So. Not until we get the um the what what check what is it called the stimulus check this I know right wait until we all get our stimulus check and then maybe <laughs> set aside twenty bucks for this <laughs> I would <laughs> I wouldn't ask you to to spend your precious stimulus check on that um, yeah. does our, that coloring book show all of the angles by chance I don't know who who has that book does it show like the anterior posterior all that. Does it have different sides? It does like the sides, the front, um, and then yeah, it does actually superior. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Superior. That's really cool. Yeah, excellent. Oh my gosh, we're gonna make this work. <laughs> Even if you guys can't like get your hands on some actual bone models, we're gonna make this work. All right, so we got through the frontal bone. I think we saw that from. And then from all the views that we can see that from. So here, see how the ethmoid bone sort of sits inside of the, or yeah, kind of sits inside the frontal bone or at least right up against it. Um, so let's just wrap our cranial bones with the parietal bone, which is this rosy red sort of color. And you can kind of see it from the anterior view. You can see it really well, obviously, from the lateral view. And again, there we do have two of them. They're paired. So this is the right parietal bone that we're seeing in this image here. Um, it does ask you to know the frontal border. So basically, that's the border that it shares with the frontal bone. The squamous border, squamosal border, is the border that it shares with the temporal bone. And this is the... Um, yeah, so this is the squamous part of the temporal bone. So I think that might just be referring to how like flat it is. I'm not really sure why we're calling it that, but that's the squamosal part of the temporal bone. And the squamosal border is the border that the parietal bone has with the temporal bone. And then the lambdoidal border is the edge that it shares with the occipital bone. This suture is called the lambdoid suture. I'm assuming that's why it's called the lambdoidal border. Um, this is the, um, the frontal or coronal suture. The sagittal suture um, joins the two parietal bones right here. It's not something that you need to memorize, um, the sagittal suture, but I wanted to leave it on there because I feel like it's, it's super important. It's just a really important thing to know. So I guess we'll probably talk about it more when we talk about joints, since this is technically a type of joint, these sutures of between these bones, because they're connecting bones. Um, we'll probably talk about the sagittal suture later, but this is something worth at least laying your eyeballs on. Um, at, if you haven't yet in your life, like this is the time to know that this is the sagittal suture and it joins your two parietal bones. So again, here are your parietal bones from the posterior view. You see a little chunk of them here from the inferior view and from the inside, got a little bit here. So really the only markings for the parietal bone that you need to know are where it um, connects to the other uh, cranial bones that it, that it um, shares borders with, right? So the frontal border, the squamosal border, and the lambdoidal border. And that's it for cranial bones. Any questions, last minute questions on cranial bones? And I'm gonna go on to facial bones. Holy crap, it's already been an hour and a half. Let's, let's get on with it. Okay. Okay, so again, here we go. I went to the same um, kind of format here. So they're uh, color-coded. Um, you have 14 facial bones, okay? A bunch of them are paired, so that helps. Uh, your lacrimal bones, your palatine bones in your uh, hard palate, and your um, nasal bones, um, your nasal conche, which are inside, your zygomatic bones, um, and your um, maxillary bones are actually paired too. So your, um, your maxilla, the upper jaw bone, is actually a paired bone. And then you also have your mandible and your vomer, which is a... Um, 
long skinny bone that uh, basically is this. You can actually feel it on the, um, in the, your septum, right behind your septum. Okay. So again, these are color coded and now we're talking about facial bones. So the only things that are in color now are your facial bones and the colors um, go along with whatever markings we're also talking about. So the infraorbital foramen is a part of the maxilla, right? Um, and there aren't nearly as many um, markings for the facial bones that you need to know. It's really the maxilla and the mandible that have markings that you need to know. So let's start with the mandible, which is your lower jaw bone and is in a um, rusty reddish orange color here, okay? For your max, oh sorry, I guess, okay, we're starting with the mandible. I am asking you to omit a couple of things for the mandible including the mandibular foramen, the alveolar process, and the alveolar ridge, okay? Those guys are really just like the ridge where your teeth sit in, um, and the process, I think, is also a part of that. So the alveolar thing is just like where your teeth go in, um, but it wasn't labeled on this one, and I'm not so super worried about it. The mandibular foramen um, is not labeled on anything that I've seen. And it's also, since it's a different thing from the mental foramen, and since I didn't have a view on the, from the inside of the jaw, it's not even something that's on the inside of the jaw. So I'm not even sure what that is, so I'm not asking you to know it. That's pretty much where I stand on that. Okay, so the body of the mandible, um, you could probably cross that out too, actually. It's not really um, that super critical, um, but it is uh, um, like this whole front part is the body of the mandible, like your chin. The mental foramen, oops, uh, is are going to be these little holes right here, which are going to supply um, blood and nerve, um, blood vessels and nerves uh, to uh, your like chin and jaw region. Okie dokie. So from an anterior view, you can see the mandible. From a lateral view, you can see the mental foramen again, the mandible body. Uh, but now we can also see the uh, other structures of the mandible that you need to know, including the ramus, which is basically like the, um, it's also known as the arm, I believe, of the mandible, but it is like this whole part here, okay? So where the, um, it connects the body of the mandible to the articular surfaces where it articulates with the, um, with the skull. Okay, so the mandibular ramus is this part of the mandible. The mandibular notch is this notch right here. So it's this like little part where it scoops out right here, mandibular notch. The mandibular condyle is here. And that is, as condyles tend to be, a, a rounded projection that is also smooth and is part of an articulation. So this is where the jaw actually articulates with the um, with the temporal bone, okay, of the skull of the cranial bones, okay, the uh, um, coronoid process up here. Let me show you. Hoping that they have the mandible separated out. Okay, so this picture you can kind of see it's not connected. Okay, so this this process right here the coronoid process up in there. In this picture, it looks like it might be connected to something, but it's not, okay? It's just sort of like a sharp point um, that ends up right there. And it, it might, when the jaw is closed, go up underneath the zygomatic arch, okay? Um, in this picture, it clearly does go up underneath the zygomatic arch. In this picture, it does not, but it basically, it's, it's free. It doesn't, it's not like attached in terms of like rubbing up against any other bone. Let's see if there's a, is there a mandible, a separate mandible floating around here somewhere? There you are. Okay, so you can see it's just a like a sharp projection, but this is the only place that connects to the skull, 
Okay, so this is where the joint is that where your jaw opens and closes from, okay? This is just sort of like hanging out there. It's a, it's a process, it's for muscles to attach to, but it's not like um, part of the joint. This is where the joint happens right there. Okay, so sorry, just wanna make that clear. Um, so that's your mandible. Obviously the mandible is removed in order to see this inferior view. Okay. Let's move on to the maxilla, okay, which is your upper jawbone, okay, and there's and it's paired so to maxillae. Professor, I just want to confirm there were only three things that we needed to cross out in the mandible, right? Correct, the last okay. Three. And okay, the thank you. Alveolar process and alveolar ridge. For the maxilla, please cross out the. Um, the zygomatic process, since we already talked about it in terms of, temp of the temporal bone, um, we're going to keep it as a, as a marking of the temporal bone. And the alveolar process, okay, which again is where your teeth connect to your maxilla. So it's like the ridge um, right here. Okay, so this is like the alveolar process, but you don't need to know it. What you do need to know is the infraorbital foramen. So remember, we have a supraorbital foramen, so above the orbital um, part of the frontal bone. The infraorbital foramen is below the orbit, right? And it also has blood vessels and nerves to feed the, uh, the muscles of the, of the face, right? Helping you to smile and squint and stuff. Sorry to interrupt you, Ashley. But, oh, um, if download an app on their phone. Um, Josie's um, boyfriend found one <clears throat> and it's called Essential Skeleton 4 and it's free on the app store. Skeleton 4. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. have all of this information like it, at least in an email, probably in an in a announcement or a discussion as well. I did start- and it's, how, it's how you like it. You could um, like click pieces of the skull and then it'll, you could see deeper into it. So you could- That's awesome. Um, Nice, nice. It's nice. Cool, awesome. Okay, well, I will recommend that as well. Essential Skeleton 4. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Cool. Yay, technology. It's going to get us through, hopefully. <laughs> so here's the maxilla from an anterior view. From a lateral view, same deal. We can see the little infraorbital foramen right there. And from an inferior view, again, here's the infraorbital foramen of the maxilla. We can see the, um, the palatine process, which, yep, is the last thing that you need to know for the maxilla. So the palatine process is basically um, your hard palate is part of your maxilla, okay? So the roof of your mouth, the hard front part of the roof of your mouth. Um, these, I could have removed, and I should have, I should have removed these because we never even, we never even talked about those. I'm not going to do it right now, but we never talked about them, so you don't need to know them, so don't worry about it. I'll remove them and re-upload. This PowerPoint. All right, when we're done here. Is there anything else that was, that's on here that shouldn't be? I'm not, I don't, I'm not asking you guys as if, like, you would know. I think that's really it. Okay. All right, any other views of the maxilla from the interior? This, I didn't ask you to know, um, just a, a cross-section view of the maxilla where you can see the palatine process from a cross-section, I guess. Mm -hmm. The orbital surface, you also don't need to know. Oh, no, you do. Sorry. All right. That was the last part of the maxilla is the orbital surface. So basically, it makes up the floor of the orbit. Okay. So the inferior most surface um, where your eyeball lives is made up by the, um, the orbital surface of the maxillary bone. Okay. So that was it for the maxilla. Yep. So let's move on to the um, all the rest of these facial bones, okay? So your zygomatic bones, again, this is your cheekbone, um, makes up the, the lower um, ridge of your orbit. You don't need to know any markings for this, okay? It's this teal color. It also makes up part of the, um, your eye socket on the inside there. 
here it is on the lateral view. From an inferior view, you can see a little bit of it. It's different from this. This is a different thing, okay? The zygomatic bone is over here. It's your cheekbones in the front of your face. It's been cut away there, and then here it is in all its full glory right here. Okay, so the zygomatic bone is like the front of your cheekbone, okay? Your nasal bones are actually going to be like the bridge of your nose, okay? And they are paired. There are two of them there. You don't even know any markings about them. Um, and you can only really see them from anterior and lateral view. Here's a cross section of it. Here's a little piece of it here too. Okay. And your lacrimal bones are two tiny little flat bones that are that make up um, this surface uh, right between your eyeball and your nose. Okay, so again, these are paired. So they are in green right here. On a lateral view, you can see them more clearly. So um, they're just this tiny little rectangular bone. Um, looks like it's, it's, well it is, it's in between your maxilla and your ethmoid bone, right? Shares a border with the zygomatic bone and the frontal bone. Um, but it's just these little rectangular bones on either side of your nose, right next to your eyeball, okay? Those are your um, lacrimal bones. So named because your lacrimal gland or your lacrimal ducts are your tear glands, right? Which are right here on the inner corners of your eyes. So the lacrimal bone is right there in that area. And you can't see it really from anywhere, but here, there is another little picture of it, lacrimal bone. Okay, no markings to needed to be known about the lacrimal bone. Your palatine bones are your hard, um, are actually your, the bone underlying your soft palate. So back here at the back of the roof of your mouth is your soft palate, okay? Your hard palate is made up by the palatine process of your maxilla. The soft palate back behind that is the, um, is, has the uh, palatine bone underlying. And again, these are paired. You have a right and a left palatine bone, okay? Um, oh shoot, these are all part of your hard palate, I guess. So I guess this is your soft palate back here. Sorry, so your maxilla make up the front, the, max, the palatine processes of your maxilla make up the front of your hard palate, and the palatine bone makes up the back of your hard palate. Excuse me, I misspoke. Um, this must then be your soft palate behind that, okay. Um, the horizontal plate, I could remove that. We actually, this isn't even part of the maxilla, is it? Oh, it is, okay. So I can remove the horizontal plate too. Okay, because that's not a thing. So quick question. Mm -hmm. So just in general, what is labeled on these slides is really what we need to know? Exactly. Yeah, it should, after you've crossed out the stuff that I've asked you to cross out, it should match your lab manual. Okay. Yeah. So it, there's a cross section of the palatine bone. So this is why this is called the horizontal plate is because the palatine bone actually goes up and there is also a vertical plate in case you're wondering. Um, but all you need to know is that that's the palatine bone. And you can't see it from there. So what are we missing here? Okay, the vomer is a funky, it's blue. It looks like almost exactly the same shade of blue as the zygomatic bone. I don't know why they did that. It's a different thing. So I made it a different shade of blue over here. It is a single pointy uh, spinous bone that you can see from an anterior view looking in through the nose. You can't see it from there, but you can see it from an inferior view. So here's the bottom of it, okay? So it's like a, a long, skinny shard. There it is. So this is the vomer right here, this long, skinny shard of bone, okay? Yeah. Okay. Been removed from there and cannot see it from here. Okay, 
So it's this one long skinny shard of bone, basically in the middle of your skull. All right, and your inferior nasal conche. These guys are lateral to the vomer, okay? And they are also paired. They're sort of a mint green color, um, or so I've decided. Can't see them from here because they're inside of there. And you can't see them from here because they're up in there. But you can see them in this cross section, right? So here, if you're looking in through the, in through the nose like this, the, um, the vomer would be in front right here. So it would be closer to us right here. And this inferior nasal concha would be farther from us on the other side. And then there is another one, so it's paired. So there's another one that's closer to us that would be overlapping the vomer right here. Hope that kind of makes sense. The, um, so here are the, uh, the conche, okay? So the nasal, inferior nasal conche are right here, okay? And that would make, that would make these guys the lacrimal bones right there. So we've got the lacrimal bones, the inferior nasal conche, and the vomer right there. Okay. Can't get enough of that thing. Really cool. Okay, so those are your facial bones. Any other questions about your facial bones before I move on? Okay. We've pretty much tackled lab 13 now. The last little bit was the ear ossicles. I'm not sure why they're having us do this now. But your ear ossicles are your inner ear bones, um, which is a misnomer because they're actually in your middle ear. Um, and we will talk about them and we will need to memorize their names um, when we get to our special senses at the end of the semester. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about these guys as of yet, okay? I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna pile these guys on top of everything else at this point. Um, but they are really teeny tiny and adorable. This is them on a penny. It's real size. So they're super cute. There's three of them. They're called the Malleus, the Incus, and the Stapes. The Malleus, because it looks like a mallet. Or it looks like a club, really, but you know, a mallet or hammer. The Incus looks um, a little bit like a, um, I guess it's supposed to sort of look like a, um, a Incus, like a, like a lead, like the thing that um, uh, the Roadrunner drops on Wile E. Coyote, like the big lead weight or like an anvil or something, right? Drops an anvil. It's supposed to sort of look like an anvil. And the stapes sort of looks like a stirrup on a horse saddle, right? The one you little part you put your foot through. Anyway, let's talk about the paranasal sinuses. These guys are um, hollow cavities right behind your face. They are actually hollow places inside of the facial bones, okay? Um, a sinus is like a hollow, a hollow part or a cave sort of thing. They are lined with mucosa, right? So cells that produce mucus. They are filled with air. Their purposes are varied and not terribly um, well known or confirmed, but they are thought to make the skull lighter, right? Since we have like a relatively big head for our bodies and we carry it at the very top of our bodies, it's nice to have our skull be a little bit lighter thanks to these paranasal sinuses. They also may enhance the resonance of your voice, um, which is interesting. They are found in the frontal, sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxillary bones of the skull. So those are three cranial and one uh, facial bone uh, that the paranasal sinuses are found in. So uh, this maxillary sinus in red here is of course inside of the maxillary bone. So your maxillary bone like has a hollow place. It has a paranasal sinus inside of it. The ethmoid air cells. So the ethmoid bone having all of those weird little um, like ridges and stuff happening in it. All of those are actually paranasal sinuses. Okay, so all of this, all these little air, they're basically little air pockets um, for the uh, paranasal sinuses of the air bone, or of the air bone, of the ethmoid bone. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry to interrupt. No, no, go for it. I just have a quick question. For lab 13, did we end up crossing anything out for the anterior and lateral views? For, for which bones? Oh, for lab 13. Yeah, we, for have the got, we haven't gotten there yet. Actually, no, you're right. We did not. No, okay. We did not. 
No, it's just, this is just the, um, that's just naming the actual bones. The only things that I've asked you to cross out are bone markings, particular oh. bone markings. So that one is, so in lab 13, it's all just the bones. So it's oh. all there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. No problem. The frontal sinus is part of your frontal bone. So there is actually a hollow place uh, inside of your frontal bone, um, which is pretty cool. So there's actually a hollow space back there. Actually, I do believe. Yeah, so here's our little hollow space of the frontal bone there. And then we've got also sphenoid sinuses in orange back here. And that is right here in green. Okay. All right, so we've got our various nasal sinuses that are associated with uh, certain cranial and facial bones, right? Frontal, maxillary, ethmoid, and sphenoid bones have hollow places in them that um, are lined with mucus producing cells and filled with air. Okay. Oh, I need to touch, touch on the hyoid bone which is a freaky little floating bone um, that's like a, um, it was part of the jaw and some fish and amphibians still use it as part of their jaw um, and part of like their gill plate and stuff. Um, but we have it, it's still sitting there and it's not attached to any other bone. It has no joints with other bones. It just floats there in soft tissue. Um, and interestingly, um, for our true crime fans out there, because I always have to bring it up, um, they can tell if someone's been strangled, at least partially, by whether or not this bone has been broken. So in a post-mortem, they'll look at the hyoid bone, and if it's been broken, then the person's been strangled. That's all you really need to know about that. The hyoid bone is a floating bone, um, right, like, under your jaw. Pretty weird. Okay. Let's move down the axial skeleton finally. Okay, so we talked about the skull. Let's talk about the vertebral column, and then we'll wrap up by talking about the ribs. Um, I don't think we're gonna have much time to talk about the developmental aspects, and I'm not terribly worried about it anyway. I'm not gonna make you know it for exams or anything. So your vertebral column, of course, is used to transmit the weight of your trunk to your lower, lower limbs, right? Because that's how it attaches to your pelvis, your entire trunk is attached to your lower limbs by your pelvis. Um, and uh, it also has the function of surrounding and protecting your spinal cord, right? So the extension of your central nervous system, your brain, passes down through the foramen magnum of the occipital bone, right? And down through the center of your vertebral column, okay? So down through the center of each one of your vertebrae. It is a flexible curved structure, of course. It contains 26 irregular bones, so it's a total of 26 vertebrae, okay? There are three different types of vertebrae that these 26 bones are um, part of. Cervical vertebrae are the vertebrae of the neck, and you have seven of them. C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7 are your cervical vertebrae of your neck. So they're the first ones, okay? Your thoracic vertebrae, T1 through T12, are the vertebrae that are associated with your thoracic cage. So these are the vertebrae that are associated with your rib cage, okay? So each one of your thoracic vertebrae is associated and is made in order to associate with a rib, okay? Anything below that is lumbar vertebrae, of which you have five. Okay, you have five lumbar vertebrae. These are the big, hefty, chunky guys, right? Uh, they're the vertebrae of your lower back, okay? So you have seven C1 through C7 cervical vertebrae up by your neck. You have uh, T1 through T12 thoracic vertebrae of your, like, of your upper back and having to do with your thoracic cage. And then you have five L1 through L5 lumbar vertebrae, which are the vertebrae of your lower back. Um, and they all look slightly different. Each vertebra in particular, of course, looks slightly different, but the types, the cervical vertebrae have certain structures associated with them um, that um, make them function a certain way. 
your thoracic vertebrae, your 12 thoracic vertebrae look a certain way because they have to articulate with your ribs, right? So they have certain special structures in order to do that. And the lumbar vertebrae um, look very distinctive as well because they are the, the main like load bearing, weight bearing vertebrae. So they tend to be really heavy and chunky. At the bottom of your vertebral column is the sacrum and the coccyx. The sacrum is the triangle shaped bone that connects the two halves of your pelvis. Okay, so those two um, flat ish irregular bones that make up the two halves of your pelvis are connected in the back by the sacrum. And the coccyx is your tailbone. You still have a tail, it's down there, and it's called your coccyx. So let's look at a picture of that. Here are your C1 through C7 cervical vertebrae right here from an anterior view and from a lateral view. And they have a distinctive kind of thing going on with their, the way that their spines are and the way that their, um, these little transverse processes are. I'm gonna talk about these um, bone markings in a second. The thoracic vertebrae T1 through T12 are all made a certain way that they have their transverse processes um, are made in order to articulate with ribs, okay? The lumbar, your five L1 through L5 lumbar vertebrae are great big fat chunky guys here and they don't have um, transverse processes like the other types of vertebrae, like your thoracic vertebrae, um, because they don't need them because they're not interacting with ribs, right? So here's all of your 26 total vertebrae uh, culminating in your sacrum right here, which is all one bone of five fused vertebrae, interestingly, right? Ashley, and here, so yeah. the, the sacral don't have um, numbers like the lumbar, how they're L1 through five? Nope, nope, because they're fused, it's just one bone. Okay, so my next question is, because. I do have a back injury, and when they look at it, they say I have something wrong with the L5S1. Interesting. Yeah, I so I'm wondering if you knew what the S meant. Yeah, it probably is, and like just referring to like that, whatever that first fused vertebra is. Oh, okay. Um, but since it's, we're just calling it the sacrum, that's probably like for doctors to be able to, to, um, to, communicate that the injury is between these two structures, right? Oh. So the top of the sacrum and the bottom of the L5 vertebra, I would imagine is why they would say that. And probably people that study the spine, like they probably do call it um, S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5. But we don't have to. We're just calling it one bone of the, called the sacrum. And then the coccyx is four fused vertebrae down here. So this little guy right here is your tailbone, and we call it the coccyx. Uh, what this is also showing is uh, uh, spinal curvatures. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too uh, later. But you've got um, two curvatures that are like this, which are um, termed convex. Cervical and lumbar are convex. And then two that are concave, your thoracic and sacral curvatures are concave. So you end up with this sort of um, S-shaped, S-shape um, with a normal spinal column. And then you can have problems that can end up with a not straight spine, right? Scoliosis and things like that, so. Professor, I wanna make sure that the um, PowerPoint is correct because what mm -hmm. you just said was that the sacral and the cervical, or no, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. are, where it says convex and concave on the actual slideshow, are those correct? Oh, just, did I misspeak? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, no, I no, just no, want to no, make sure. sure. I always wonder if it's having to do if it's like from the front or from the back. So this is like facing somebody's back. So the cervical vertebrae would be um, would be concave according to you, and the lumbar vertebrae would be concave away from you, right? And then the thoracic vertebrae would be convex coming out towards you and the sacral curvature would be convex coming out towards you. Sorry, does that clarify? No, that's okay, convex towards you, concave back. Yeah, yeah. so convex okay. is coming out like this and concave is, is kind, of like, kind of like a cave, right? So going away from you. Going away Got from it, you. okay, that Sorry. makes sense. Sorry if I misspoke. Okay. No, that's okay. All right, so, oh, so here are the curvatures again. 
So you've got cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. The cervical and lumbar are concave, and the thoracic and sacral are convex, uh, right? So um, if you're looking at somebody's back. So you've got problems if you have um, a spine that is not straight from this, from this view, right? So if you've got curvature of the spine, um, like on a lateral plane like that, then you have what is called scoliosis. If you have um, too much of a concave, sorry, convex curvature of the thoracic curvature, um, that is known as kyphosis. And if you have uh, too much curvature, too much uh, concave curvature of the lumbar region, uh, that is known as swayback. Um, and you have what is called lordosis, okay? So those three are um, the names of the abnormal spine curvatures. So scoliosis is curving too much like this. Kyphosis is too much curve right here, causing a hunchback appearance. And lordosis is too much curve here, which kind of has the appearance of like, sort of like sticking your butt out, okay? So Miss, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go for it. So is it like um, scoliosis is like, in the cervical and then it can be throughout throughout cons cons yeah consider scoliosis to be like throughout since we're talking about like from like a side to side curvature oh, okay right so this is a lateral so if we're looking at the spinal cord spinal column from the front from an anterior or a posterior view mm -hmm. curvature from side to side is scoliosis and that can happen anywhere along the length of the spinal column Oh, okay. okay. The kyphosis and the lordosis are uh, um, like an anterior posterior plane. So it'd be more of like the mid sagittal plane in terms of like the curvature happening like along the normal curvatures of the spine, but just um, too much, just magnified too much. Now, are these things that you can be born with or can these things happen throughout your life at some point as well? You know, that I don't know. That's a good question. I bet it says in your textbook at the back of the chapter. Out of curiosity, I have to know now. <laughs> Let's see. Kyphosis, um, degeneration of the intervertebral discs leads to kyphosis. Oh, wow. Okay, so hang on. So scoliosis, most common abnormality occurs. Lateral bending of the vertebral column. Oh, usually in the thoracic region, so good question, may result from congenitally malformed vertebrae, so at birth, or a chronic pain like sciatica can cause scoliosis from just probably just crunching up in a particular direction. Um, let's see, one, paralysis of muscles on one side of the vertebral column, uh, poor posture, or one leg being shorter than the other can all cause scoliosis. And kyphosis, so the hunchback appearance, um, so curvature of the cervical spine. Mm. Uh, let's see, tuberculosis of the spine can cause it, where the vertebral bodies partially collapse. And in the elderly, degeneration of the intervertebral discs can lead to kyphosis. And it may also be caused by rickets and poor posture common in females with advanced osteoporosis. Wow. And then lordosis, which would be um, an uh, exaggeration of this spinal curvature here, of the lumbar curvature, um, some kind, sometimes called hollow back. Increase in the lumbar curve of the vertebral column results from increased weight of the abdomen, as in pregnancy or extreme obesity, poor posture, rickets, osteoporosis, or tuberculosis of the spine. Yeah, so very interesting. So, you know, do your do your core exercises, you know, before you get pregnant, I guess, so that you avoid avoid um, this increased curvature there in lordosis. Very interesting. Yeah, so that was on your that's on pages two forty nine and two fifty of your text. If you're curious about details like that, and who is it? Let's be honest. Okay, so in between the vertebrae of your spinal column 
in sort of a blue color here are your intervertebral discs. And if you'll recall, they are made of fibrocartilage, right? So fibrocartilage is the type that's very, very dense and good for shock absorption. So your intervertebral discs are made of fibrocartilage. There's two regions of the intervertebral discs, annulus and nucleus propulsus. Don't worry about that. I just want you to know that they are in between your vertebrae and that they are made of fibrocartilage. Okie dokie. All right, so let's talk about some uh, bone markings and general structure of the vertebrae. Every vertebra has a vertebral body or a centrum. On this one that I'm showing you here, uh, this is a cervical vertebra, and I can tell because the body or centrum is very small here, okay? There's also a vertebral arch. So that's kind of like the opposite part, the opposite side of the vertebral body is the vertebral arch. Um, it is composed of pedicles and laminae. So a pedicle is a um, is like the connecting portion between um, the body and the spine is process. And the laminae um, are also like another, basically the term for like the other part of the um, connector between the body and the spinous process. So you've got a pedicle and a lamina. Um, which enclose their vertebral foramen, which is this hole here, right? So a foramen is a hole, and this is the vertebral foramen, um, foramina plural. And then the intervertebral foramina are the openings that can only be seen when the vertebrae are actually stacked. Um, so these are lateral openings. So it is would be considered um, like this, the intervertebral, oops, Yes, the intervertebral foramen um, is going to be caused by the gap formed in between the spinous processes of two adjacent vertebrae. Okay, so that's different from the, so you got the, the vertebral foramina and the intervertebral foramina. Okay, I hope that's clear. All right, so let's talk about, let's look at differences between the different types of vertebrae. We've got cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, and they all have slightly different structures even though they have the same basic um, structures that we just talked about. So on all of these, you ha they have the, cerebral or the vertebral body, right? So here's the body on a, on a cervical vertebra. Here's the body on a, of a thoracic vertebra. And here's the body of a lumbar vertebra. Notice how big the body of the lumbar vertebra is because it's bearing the most weight, right, of everything all above it. So bearing a lot of weight here, very large body. The vertebral foramen or foramina of all of these is here, here, and here. And of course, that is going to be where the spinal cord is actually passing through down the spine, right? So those, those uh, foramina would be about here. So the spine would pass through the spinal col column right like that. We also have a spinous process. Okay, so that's going to be the back part of the vertebrae. So when you actually can feel your spine along your back, what you're actually feeling there are your spinous processes. Okay, so each one of those bumps of your spine is the spinous process of a vertebra, okay? And all of your vertebrae have them. So your cervical vertebrae have them. They look a little bit like this, so they're a little bit weirder, a little bit weird and different. Your um, spinous, pro spinal, spinous processes of your thoracic vertebrae are like the really spiny ones and the ones that you can, that some people you can see them on, right? Some uh, just normally, or if you're, if you're underweight, but some, for some people just normally. Um, I, I can always, I've always been able to see mine. Um, I always thought that it was like, cause there was something wrong with me, but it's not, it's normal. So if you can see your spinous processes, um, that's normal. And if you, I'm sorry, I have to move my Zoom stuff around. And the uh, spinous processes of your lumbar vertebrae are um, also very, very large, but you generally can't see them because they're in this uh, concave curvature, uh, lumbar curvature there. Okay, so you have spinous processes along the back of each vertebra. 
But then side to side, you, have, you also have processes. And these are called transverse processes, okay? The transverse processes of cervical vertebrae are pretty much non-existent. The transverse processes of lumbar vertebrae are, um, they're relatively small and undeveloped um, and not, um, I mean, they're obviously, they have their purpose, but on thoracic vertebrae is where the transverse processes are really, really important. And that's because they are responsible for articulating with the ribs, okay? So it is these side-to-side -side projections on the thoracic vertebrae. So, so this is like, if we're looking down on this vertebrae, this is the anterior part. This is the posterior part, right? Because this is the part you can feel from your back. And then these transverse processes from side-to-side -side are where the ribs attach, right? to form your thoracic cage. So the transverse processes of your thoracic vertebrae are super important. Um, don't worry so much about, let's see, what is your, we're back to lab 11, by the way. And you're talking about articular processes. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so don't worry about the articular processes. We're talking about um, transverse processes um, of the thoracic vertebrae is really what's most important. There are not really transverse processes for, for cervical vertebrae um, and uh, um, the transverse processes of lumbar and vertebrae are small. They also have articular processes, but don't worry about, don't worry about those. My cat is dreaming. It's over there dreaming. Cute. Okay. Finally, we have um, on cervical vertebrae, you have transverse uh, foramen. So you have a vertebral foramen, right? Remember, you have a um, intervertebral foramen caused by the stacking of the vertebrae. And then on cervical vertebrae, you have these special transverse foramen, which are basically just for the blood vessels and nerves, um, for certain blood vessels and nerves to pass up. Um, to your skull, okay? Um, your thoracic and lumbar vertebrae do not have transverse foramina. So we've got laminae, which are holding the spinous process to the transverse process, okay? And the pedicle is not on this picture. So let's see if we can find a picture of a pedicle. Oh, nope, nope. Okay, so I'm going to have you actually cross out pedicle. On lab 11, for the typical vertebrae, the, where did it go? I lost it, oh, right here, the pedicle. So the pedic, there's, there's like, um, there is a distinction between a pedicle and a lamina, obviously, or they wouldn't name them two different things, but I'm not going to ask you to know it. The, call, consider the lamina to be like the arms that are holding the body of the vertebra to the spinous process. Okay, so the lamina is going to be like whatever's in between here and 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 here. Okay. Okay. What else had, what else did I not cover? I didn't cover the, I didn't cover the inferior notch. I'm saying no to the articular processes. Um, no articular processes. This is really hard to do. <laughs> both superior and inferior? The yeah, for yeah, for articular processes, cross out both superior and inferior. We took out the inferior notch and the pedicle. The um, we are going to talk about the facets when we get to ribs. So hang tight on the the demi facet and the facet. For the um, for the next part, we're talking about the atlas and the axis on page thirty eight for lab eleven. 
those are your first two cervical vertebrae. They just have special names because they are very, very weird and special. Here they are. So they're all the way up here. We've got the atlas on top and the axis underneath it. So the atlas is really funky looking and the axis is funky looking, um, even though you can't really tell from this picture. I'll show you another picture in a second. But check out these, uh, um, these facets on the atlas here. Remember when we talked about the, um, the occipital, uh, okay, the occipital condyles, right? At the base of the skull. Those occipital condyles interact with these um, facets, these condyles of the atlas. And um, that's how your skull sits on top of your spinal column. The axis has a special structure called the dens. So it actually has this crazy, weird, long projection bump thing at the front that passes all the way up through the atlas, okay? And that bump is called the dens. And the dens is what allows the atlas to rotate on top of the axis and allow your head to rotate, okay? Um, on top of your um, spinal column. So uh, there's nothing here, I don't think that, well, let's see, we talked about different spinous processes. Oh, bifid, so this is, a, so the, the spinous processes of your cervical vertebrae are bi, um, bifurcated. So they're, um, they're split in two like this, but they're still just the spinous processes as far as you're concerned. Um, here's a spinous process of, a, um, of your last uh, cervical vertebra, which is not bifurcated. We've got, we're not talking about articular processes, but we're talking about transverse processes. These guys. So just know that the C1, your C1 vertebra is your atlas, also known as the atlas. And your C2 vertebra is also known as your axis. And here they are separated. So here's the atlas where your skull actually sits on. And here is the axis with its dens structure. The dens goes up through the center of the atlas, allowing the atlas to rotate, ooh, hello, to rotate back and forth on top of the um, axis, right? So the dens is kind of allowing, it's kind of a place for your, um, your skull to be able to rotate back and forth, so you to be able to look side to side. Okay, so atlas and axis, special structure on the axis is the dens. Okay, um, you do have these little uh, transverse uh, foramina on, the, uh, on both actually, right? So you can see them there on the atlas and on the axis. Okay, any questions about your uh, general vertebra stuff, vertebrae stuff, and the atlas and axis. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Let's talk about the base of your spinal column, the sacrum. Again, five fused vertebrae, um, four fused for the coccyx, which is your tailbone down at the very bottom here. And this is where your two, um, where this, uh, where your left hip bone or side of your pelvis is going to articulate with the sacrum there. And then you've got another um, facet on this side as well. Um, you don't, let's see, what else do we not even know? Articular fossa for the ilium. No, promontory. Okay, well, if I haven't included it, then I'm not worried about it. Okay, so the ala is where the pelvic bone articulates with the sacrum, and you have one on each side, right? Your, the body of the sacrum is this whole thing here. We have the, oh, it's called the, Spinal foramen. Oh, the sacral foramina. 
sacral foramina are here, which would make this the spinal foramen. It's called the sacral canal on here. Spinal foramen is this um, large opening right here that the spine actually passes through. Spinal tubercles, you don't need to know. Um, articular facets, superior articular processes, I think are gonna be these. Um, I'm gonna have to find you guys a better image of this that's labeled more appropriately. Unfortunately, as with all biology, there's multiple multiple terminologies for these things. The ala seems to line up and the sacral foramina seems to line up, but the rest of it, not so much. So I'm gonna find you guys a better image that has this labeled better, or I'll just relabel this with your actual terms. So I'll just relabel the sacrum. Okay, so I'm gonna do that too. Okay, so let's talk about ribs. We've got 12 pairs of ribs, right? So six on each side. They all attach posteriorly to thoracic vertebrae, right? Hence why they are called thoracic vertebrae. They're making up your thoracic cage. Um, the first seven pairs going from the top down are considered true vertebrae, or, I'm sorry, true ribs, okay? So your true ribs are ones that are actually um, attached to both your vertebrae at the back and your sternum at the front, okay? So your actual rib cage with, oops, I'm rearranging it. Okay. So your first seven ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, uh, directly connect to both a thoracic vertebra in the back posteriorly and then they all but they also connect directly to the sternum at the front okay so your first seven ribs one through seven are true ribs and then ribs eight through twelve are considered false ribs because they um, they attach obviously to vertebrae at the back, but they don't attach directly to the sternum in the front. Instead, this one in particular uh, connects indirectly via rib seven, right? So this is a false rib because it's not connecting directly. This is also a false rib, false rib, false rib. And then you have two floating ribs, okay? 11 and 12 are also called vertebral or floating ribs because they only attach to vertebrae at the back. They don't even, they don't even attach to the, uh, to the sternum in front. Okay, so no attachment to the sternum for pairs 11 and 12. So one through seven are true ribs, eight through 12 are false ribs, and 11 and 12 are also known as floating ribs, okay? Okay, so here's another picture of that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven true ribs. One, two, three, four, five false ribs, the last two of which are also called floating ribs, okay? Your sternum is actually composed of three different parts. We're on page 39 of your lab manual now, lab 12. Wrapping up with lab 12 here. So we've got the, uh, the body of the sternum, which is the main part that you think of when you think of sternum. But there's actually another little part at the top that is not um, completely attached. There is actually an articulation there. Um, that, uh, that attachment, that articulation, is known as the sternal angle. Okay, And the top part is called the manubrium. Okay, the manubrium has the jugular notch at the top, and it also has clavicular notches uh, lateral to the jugular notch. 
okay? Those clavicular notches are where the clavicles, right, attach to the sternum, okay? So the jugular notch is there, clavicle notch is there. This is the manubrium. Here's the um, sternal angle. Here is the uh, sternum body. And then you have a little piece of cartilage down at the bottom in blue here called the ziphoid process. So the ziphoid process makes the last third part of your sternum. So we have ziphoid process, sternal angle, clavicular facets, of which there are two, the manubrium, and the jugular or interclavicular, so in between the two clavicles, interclavicular or jugular notch. It's, it's referred to as both in your lab manual, and I, so I will accept either. Uh, the last part are the, oh, I guess the, the, the body of the sternum is also called the gladiolus. That's interesting. I guess I'll accept either for that as well. I would just call it the sternal body or the body of the sternum, but the gladiolus is also a fun word if you want to memorize it on top of everything else. Um, the last thing is the costal facets. So these are the places where true ribs one through seven uh, connect directly to the sternum. So each one of these little places where a rib connects through a uh, hyaline cartilage, right, is called a costal, costal or costal facet, okay? So you have four of those, uh, two associated with the manubrium, one, two, three, four, five, six associated with the sternum body, okay? Any questions about the sternum? All right, let's talk about ribs. Structures of a typical rib. Ribs have heads. I actually have a tiny little rib here. Look at this. I don't even know what this is a rib of, but it's super cute. This is this tiny little rib. So every rib has a head and a neck, okay? Um, it also has a tubercle. There's gonna be too hard to see on this, right? Um, for muscles to attach to. Um, the tubercle oh, articulates precisely with the transverse coastal facet of same number thoracic vertebra. Okay, and then the shaft is the long skinny part of the rib. So let's look at a better picture of this. Okay, so here is the head of the rib interacting with the, um, the costal facet on the vertebra, on the body of the vertebra, which I'm not asking you to be able to identify on the vertebra. Um, but the head articulates with the vertebra at the costal facet and also at the transverse um, process. There's a facet at the end of the transverse process. So um, on this one, that's gonna be here and here. So these little guys, um, are going to articulate with the rib as well. So the ribs actually articulate in two different places um, on the thoracic vertebrae that they are associated with, at the costal facet, and then again at the transverse um, process, at the end of the transverse process. This costal facet articulates with the head of the rib. Then you have the neck of the rib, which is this narrow spot right here. The tubercle, of the rib, which is just a bump here for um, muscles and ligaments to attach to. And then the um, tubercle of the rib is the second place where the um, rib articulates with the vertebra, okay? So the head articulates with the body of the vertebra, and then the tubercle of the rib articulates with the um, transverse process of the vertebra, okay? So this rib is interacting with this vertebra, right? The head here and the tubercle um, here, even though it's really hard to see in this picture. Here's the shaft of the rib, which is most of it, right? Do we need to know the angle of the rib? Okay, so this is the angle of the rib. It's at the back part, okay? 
and the The costal groove, do I care? I don't think I care. I don't care about the costal groove, okay? Costal groove can go away. We did this. Um, first and second rib, I don't know why that's a thing, why that's being pointed out here. Hmm. Don't worry about the first and second rib either. Crossing those out. Okay, so for your ribs, don't worry about first and second rib. You do have to know that like one through seven is a true rib, right? Um, eight through 12, eight through 12. Okay, so remember one through seven are true ribs, eight through 12 are false ribs, and 11 and 12 are floating ribs, okay? Uh, typical rib, I don't really know what the point of that is either. You can cross that out too. Um, and then the sternal end of the rib is of course going to be the opposite end of the head, right? So if the head of the rib is interacting with a thoracic vertebra, the sternal or costal end of the rib is going to have the, uh, that hyaline cartilage that attaches the end of the rib to the sternum, okay? Oh, the costal groove is this groove in the rib. Um, not worried about it. Okay, um, that's probably for your intercostal muscles to attach to. Any questions about the ribs? Okay, it is 4.30. Um, oh, here's another view of that, uh, same thing. The head interacting with the body of the vertebra, the tubercle interacting with the transverse process of the vertebra, the shaft of the rib, uh, the neck of the rib, um, the vertebral foramen, the spinous process, the other transverse process, the body. Um, more sternum stuff. This is for you to help you to um, see another view of this. First and second ribs, I don't know, because they, the first one attaches to the manubrium? I don't know. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm gonna talk about developmental aspects. I'm not gonna ask you to, um, oh, I'm gonna have to ask you to know some of this. Let's talk about, for, this is for lecture. This is lecture stuff that you need to know. You need to know about the fontanelles. So infant skulls have more bones than adult skulls, believe it or not, because they're not fused yet. So you end up having more bones at the beginning uh, when you're first born, and then they fuse together to form other bones. So you end up having fewer bones after that happens. Um, and then as you grow to be an adult. The, uh, the mandible, right, and the frontal bones are unfused in infants. So basically you have a right and a left half of the mandible when you're first born and you have a, a right and left half of a, your frontal bone when you're first born, but then they fuse to form two solid bones, single solid bones. And that's for the, that's for like them to be able to come out of the birth canal, right? Is that why they're yeah, not? Yeah, that's okay. a big, it's a big part of it. Yeah. So in order, so yeah, in order for the ginormous head of an infant to pass through the birth canal, it needs to be able to compress a certain amount. So since it's not, since they're not fused all the way already, it allows a little bit more like bending and movement of the skull. So the actual like skull is able to like, kind of like be morphed a little bit in order to fit through. Pretty crazy. Yeah, so those, all of the skull bones are connected instead of being connected by the sutures that like you have in an adult skull, they're connected by fontanelles, um, which are, these um, unossified, so not bone, um, they're like fibrous connective tissue membranes between the bones. So they're kind of like, the, the bones of the skull are kind of like floating and then you've got these little like soft spots and those soft spots on the, on the baby's head are fontanelles and they fuse eventually um, to form bone, obviously. There are four of them. They have, they have an anterior, a posterior, a mastoid and a sphenoid fontanelle. And here they are. 
This is the anterior fontanelle. Here are the two unfused bones um, of the frontal bone, right? The anterior fontanelle is between those and the two bones of the parietal bones. The posterior fontanelle is between the parietal bones and the occipital bone. The uh, mastoid fontanelle is back behind the ear um, between the occipital bone and the temporal bone. And then the sphenoidal fontanelle is at the temple, right? So that's where you got the, the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. It's right above the greater wing of the, wing of the sphenoid bone. So that's the sphenoidal fontanelle over there. So one, two, three, four. These, of course, being paired, right? Okay. So that's actually two, four, five, six total fontanelles. So at birth, um, hence needing fontanelles, the cranium is ginormous, especially compared to the face uh, and the rest of the body, right? So babies have this great big head and this little tiny face on front. <laughs> the, um, at nine months of age, so like almost not even a year, the, uh, their, the head is almost half of an adult size, which is crazy when you think about, is the rest of the baby's body half of adult size? Hell no, it's not. The head is huge compared to the rest of the body. So the mandible and the maxilla also are foreshortened. So you have like kind of a receding chin kind of an action going on there, um, which is super cute, uh, but they will lengthen with age. And then as the baby grows up, the arms and legs grow faster than the, um, the head and the trunk, which eventually leads to um, normal adult proportions, right? So the head doesn't grow nearly as fast as the rest of the body um, because the rest of the body needs to catch up with the head. Okay, spinal curvatures. So when you're first born, you basically just have one curvature, one spinal curvature, right? You can see it here. The primary curvature makes the spine a, a C shape and it's convex posteriorly again, right? So coming out towards you posteriorly convex posteriorly. Um, and then as you um, grow and develop, you end up developing your secondary curvatures. So basically, when you get big enough to be able to raise your head, you start to develop the cervical curvature. And then when you begin to walk and sit upright and walk, that is when you develop that lumbar curvature, right? So it's, it's is that why they have like those seats for infants to sit in to help with the curvature? Is that what those are for? Yeah, I think um, I actually have not heard of that. They have them to help them with um, with learning how to sit up because it's part of part of developing is like learning how to do that without help. Right. Like so to, the ability for an infant to be able to do that and um, to raise its head is obvious, but it also develops proper curvatures of the spine. So using those muscles and having to do that on their own is actually really important for development. And I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what something like that would actually um, be doing, maybe just to help them rest in that position, but I know that it would be, it's important to let them um, have time of, of having to do it on their own without help to, to develop these curvatures, to, um, to get to a normal, normal spinal curvatures. But I just think this is like, the neatest picture. Okay, and then of course, let's talk about some old age and then um, maybe, I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything else disease wise, but old age stuff. So you, uh, as you get older, your intervertebral discs, right? That fibrocartilage pad in between each of your vertebrae, um, it, gets, uh, it gets dehydrated. So basically it's not able to um, absorb uh, any fluid. It becomes thinner and it becomes less bouncy and elastic. So the consequences of that um, being less hydrated means it's not as flexible, um, less elastic, not as flexible. And if it becomes thinner, that's why you actually get shorter um, as you get older. And I read this in your textbook, which is really cool. You, uh, when you're sleeping and the pressure comes off of your intervertebral discs, um, they rehydrate during that time. So when you get up in the morning, you're actually a little bit taller than when you go to bed at night, which I thought was pretty cool. 
As you get older, the risk of disc herniation increases. So a hernia is, of course, um, would be like slipping a disc. So the disc would be squeezed out from in between the two vertebrae. So um, a hernia in that respect, it's like coming out where it shouldn't be. Um, you lose, uh, you lose uh, height, right? So loss of stature because your intervertebral discs are becoming thinner. Your uh, costal cartilage, so the cartilage that connects your ribs to your um, sternum starts to ossify, so it's not as flexible. So the thorax becomes rigid. And then of course, all of your bones lose mass. And we, as we learned on Tuesday, we can um, try to uh, avoid a lot of this by getting enough um, vitamin D and calcium and doing weight-bearing exercises, right? Always doing your weight-bearing exercises, staying active and doing uh, hormone replacement therapy if you, if you go through menopause or, or um, lose estrogen for one reason or another. And that, my friends, is that. Any other questions before I wrap up this recording and then get it, get it up to you guys? I'm going to write you guys an email at the very least. I'll probably do a, um, I have a discussion actually going here um, for skeletal system. Bones, okay, so I don't know if you've seen this yet, but I made a new discussion for bones and I want you guys to ask any of your skeletal system questions here, um, if you have any, um, uh, and I'll answer them when I see them. Um, we can also, I'll share images here and stuff as well, so. Um, let me uh, modify and re-upload the PowerPoint. Let me upload this video onto YouTube and then post the link. And then I'll start doing some research about what you guys can be doing for your, um, for the actual lab proper, I guess. So basically it would be like labs 11 through 13, do like a cranial facial bone skull, um, color it in kind of thing. Maybe I'll try and find something similar for um, the, um, the um, vertebral column and the thoracic cage. And uh, so basically that'll be like 12 points for whatever I can round up for you guys to do. And I'll make sure to keep a very open, clear line of communication about what it is that I want you guys to do. I'll be emailing, I'll make announcements, and I'll post it in this discussion as well so that you guys know exactly what it is. Um, oh, I'll probably put it in the assignments as well. That's what I'll do. Um, details in assignments. So when you actually go to upload, where you go to upload your assignments, when you go to see labs 11, 12, and 13, um, I will actually put a description inside of there for what the heck it is that I want you guys to actually do. So. I'll basically like add a description in here that'll be part of it. I have a question. Yep, go for it. For those labs, like how Jessica like uh, showed us a coloring book she had, if we find the bones like from the labs and we color it and cut it out and paste it onto our lab book. Dude, there are so many fun crafty ways to do this. So we could do like a, um, yeah, do like a paper skeleton thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this would be a really fun, it's a really fun project like to do like, you know, with kids or with family yeah. or with, you know, like whatever, like, it'll just be a fun project. I'll find some of those too. Okay. Yeah, I'll find some of those. I'm, I don't know if I'll make it like required, but I'll just find them and post them just so that you guys will have something, something fun to do. It's a good one. That's definitely a good one. You label all the ribs, all the vertebrae. Yes, absolutely. Good call. Anything else? Yeah, we actually made pretty good time. So I'll come back at 5.30 um, and be here hanging out in case you guys have any other specific questions, just like I did on Tuesday. Um, nobody had any questions on Tuesday, so I didn't post, I didn't record or post anything. So um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and call it then if there aren't any other questions and um, let me know if you think of anything. I'll be here at 5.30, all right? Have a good night, you guys. Signing off. Hold on, got here. Last minute question? Professor, really quick. Um, last minute, I'm sorry. No. So next next Tuesday and Thursday, we're kind of gonna be going over this as well, right? So our main focus is just to study what we just learned right now. Next Tuesday and Thursday, there will be no actual lecturing. I'm not gonna add any additional um, material. 
um, I'll be, I'll do like office hours, like three hours on Tuesday and three hours on Thursday, regular time. Um, if you guys like have questions about the labs or anything. Um, and then on, then the next week, we're going to talk about appendicular skeleton. So uh, however you want to use your spring break, whether it's, I, I, I would hope and assume that it would be working on at least labs 11 through 11, 12, and 13, right? Um, we have a quiz over the weekend on bone tissue. Then over spring break, we'll have quiz seven, which will be on the axial skeleton. Um, so you'll be working on your quiz. You can be working on your labs um, because I'll tell you what it is that I'm gonna be, that we're gonna be doing for labs, but long before then. Um, and then getting ahead on appendicular if you want to, you know. Got it. So just, I just wanted to confirm Tuesdays and Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday of next week, we're going to have an opportunity to have que our questions okay. answered. Like, let's say we go over it. We're like, oh my gosh, I can't find this in any image. What? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. Definitely. Yeah, that's the idea. So I'll, I'm just going to be here like regular time. I'm just going to be like, hey guys, I'm just, I'll just have a book. And if nobody has questions, then I'll just hang out and, you know, just keep it casual. Okay. Thank you, professor. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I had a question that like what's what's the difference between lab and lecture really and it's not there is oh, I'm gonna be doing this whoa same thing in lab and lecture um, doing the same thing <laughs> that um, the only difference for lecture is the developmental and the aging aspects so that's really a much that's really the difference between those two things that's really that Ashley right. I know you have yep. lab three April thirtieth I believe. Um, do you know when you'll be releasing the study guide since it is a lot of information to take in and we do have to find a way. How, how does, well, how does the end of spring break sound since I'm going to have, since I'll have time to do that. That'd be okay. So like uh, the week that lasts, let's see, 16, 17, 18, 19, like the 19th, April 19th. That works for me. Will that work? That works for me. I don't know. I don't want to speak for everybody. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's two weeks prior uh, versus the one week prior that we've been working with. So um, that should be, that should be good or almost two weeks. So we'll do, um, we'll have the study guide by 419. I can do that. Okay. Okay. I'll be back at 530. And if I don't see you then then um i'll see you next tuesday for office hour stuff spring break office hour stuff Enjoy awesome weekend, guys. thank you see you later and see if i can find how to turn this off i like it here we go all right bye